uh, we believe that there's a lot that people studying games can take away from uh, specialists in artificial intelligence, uh, and that people in AI can learn more about these artifacts that they're studying or that they're using as test beds um, by speaking with game designers who, who have a lot of domain knowledge in these kinds of dynamical systems. Uh, I hope that we can share some of the tools that we've built up in our um, individual disciplines and some approaches to knowledge representation. And I also hope that we can find ways to uh, approach problems that we have from different perspectives than maybe we're used to. I think that's a real benefit of getting people from different backgrounds into one room. Um, those of you who do research in games might be familiar with speed runs, uh, trying to complete a game as quickly as possible, um, maybe using tricks or skipping parts of the game. Um, it's interesting to think of this as a kind of graph, uh, operation on graphs. Uh, if you are not a games researcher, um, you might still be interested in, say, uh, point-and-click adventure games or role-playing games, uh, observing traces of these games as a way to um, mine a kind of knowledge base of common sense interactions. So if there's something you do, I mean, I don't, maybe it's not all point and click adventure games are a good, uh, good data source to learn from, that they often have somewhat arbitrary puzzles, but I think it might be uh, an interesting direction. Uh, and if you work in kind of core AI search, it, it'd be that um, maybe you could recast a problem like general game playing uh, as, as coming up with a program to play a game effectively. So our probably most important goals from my perspective for this workshop, um, besides the, the scholarly work, which is really important, is to um, get people talking who weren't talking before and uh, maybe kick off some, some new collaborations into the future. The co-organizers uh, have been working a bit uh, over the last year, we've, we've had some some real success with projects in getting stuff out of games. Uh, this is like, I don't know, bragging a little bit, but the I, I want to give a sense for how um, there's a lot of appetite right now for this kind of work uh, in the uh, like in the world of conferences right now and workshops. So uh, uh, Adam Somerville and I had some work on automatically mapping out game worlds uh, by observation. Uh, we used a little bit of inductive bias to figure out when a transition between rooms was happening, uh, distinct from regular sort of smooth scrolling around the continuous space. Uh, we uh, sort of stepped in on digital humanities turf with work uh, analyzing the jumping behavior of characters in different games. Um, again, this was by driving an emulator and observing, uh, I think in this case, uh, memory locations or pixel data. Um, What's cool is that if this is automated, you can run it on you know dozens of games, um, do something like principal components analysis on the parameters that you recover in your model, and cluster the <coughs> characters into like different groups according to these uh, your uh, components. Uh, you can do some kind of comparisons, like here's a bunch of different characters in Mario games and how their jumps are are uh, the same or different, and here's a bunch of different games developed by Nintendo. Um, you might have a hypothesis like different development studios, you know, working on the NES in the in the mid 80s might have like their jumping routine that they like move from game to game. Uh, or you might have a hypothesis that a uh, game character, you know, if it's um, Spider-Man or, or Batman or something that no matter which company develops that game, you would expect that the character would sort of jump or move in a certain way. And these are some tools to address uh, those kinds of questions. Uh, that was at the foundations of digital games, um, but even outside of games conferences. So uh, at Ichikai last year, we presented some work on um, recovering hybrid automata models from observations of game characters using segmented regression. Uh, and uh, Matthew had an Ichikai paper on learning transition rules for game worlds by uh, uh, by observation of video. So. Um, it's a very lively area right now. Uh, we have a summary paper at Computational Intelligence in Games uh, last year on this kind of umbrella project and all of the different fields it intersects with. Uh, so if you're curious in the, about the topics of this workshop and are looking for maybe some other communities that um, you know maybe you could 
like publish at their conferences or at least read their their proceedings. Uh, I think that paper is a good place to start. Uh, today we have a lot of really exciting work. Uh, I'm going to just very briefly run through it um, and uh, get everybody excited and pumped up for <laughs> these talks. Uh, so we have some work that you'll see on uh, combina combinational creativity. So uh, trying to blend concepts uh, in the context of game level generation uh, using a variety of different blending modes uh, as, as you would try to uh, um, which, which, which connects strongly with topics in computational creativity. Uh, we have work on common sense understanding and pulling out distinct game uh, interaction modes like bartering or, or uh, puzzle solving or combat from uh, a combination of, uh, well, from, from on screen images. We have uh, new approaches to agent architecture for, uh, for agents that. Uh, uh, sort of learn high-level models while they're playing. Um, we have other approaches to this question of uh, coming up with high-level planning operations from low-level behavior uh, in in the form of uh, uh, network intents. We have uh, other exciting approaches to uh, the problem of transfer, for example, by lifting concrete game states into uh, concept networks, which are themselves learned from uh, observation. Um, Adam, you need better screenshots in your papers. <laughs> uh, we have just like Super Mario in there or something. Uh, we have work in uh, uh, neural uh, network encodings of game states to try to recover from, say, a screenshot or from uh, a memory snapshot uh, moments in the meantime. Uh, the uh, the other Adam also needs to put pictures into his papers. Um, we have worked on uh, inductive logic, uh, learning predicates from uh, about game dynamics from uh, just just from static analysis of games. Um, yeah, learning, for example, that somebody controls something that the player has an has an influence over an outcome in a game. Um, yeah, you all also have no pictures in your paper. Uh, and, and we have uh, exciting approaches, uh, exciting ways to deploy existing technology from the plan activity intent recognition community uh, in the context of games. Uh, so I'm very happy to see work also that connects us to other, other communities. Today we're split up into a few different thematic groups. Uh, we will start with a uh, speculative session, um, continue in on a, after a coffee break on a theme of state extraction. Uh, after lunch, some invited speakers. We're very excited for our invited speakers. Uh, Slate, uh, Emily Short, and uh, Raph Koster are, are, are both um, sort of uh, veteran game designers. And uh, Ben Samuel at the University of New Orleans is a game designer and AI researcher, uh, who also is an award-winning game designer. Uh, and finally, we'll end with uh, a gameplay session uh, uh, themed paper presentations. So thank you for putting up with me for um, 13 minutes <laughs> and 15 seconds. Uh, I wow, think well we should done. get started. Oh, shit. And it is moving slowly forward. I'm just going mark the time. Some small uh, spoilers. Um, should we close the door? Is that distracting? Do you think more people are coming in? That's a great idea. Good thing. compromise. It's such, such big ideas. All right, cool. Uh, so hey, folks, uh, I am Matthew Guzdial, um, and this is some work from myself and my advisor, Mark Vidal. Uh, we're both at Jura Tech. I didn't put a Jura Tech logo on there, uh, but let's pretend that I did, uh, as I think my advisor would have appreciated that. Um, you also note that in 
the schedule and in fact the paper itself, I wrote combina uh, combinatorial here. Uh, that was a, in fact a terrible mistake to, that I just happened to do over and over again. Uh, and it should be combinational every single time. So let's all just pretend that that's the case. Um, so yeah, so I'll be talking about combinational creativity for procedural content generation via machine learning. Um, so what does that mean? I'm going to break it apart sort of piece by piece. Uh, the first bit is procedural content generation. For anybody who's not familiar, thought it was worth talking about. The big idea for procedural content generation is that some human designer is going to take their expert game design knowledge and input that into some algorithm. Uh, and then that algorithm is going to be used to produce content. And that content can be things like uh, game structure, like levels or puzzles. It can be story, it can be quests, it can be art assets, it can be anything, any sort of content you might want for your game. Um, but, uh, and, oh, and so this can be used to make all really cool sky or level structure. And uh, you can see, can you hear this? I can. Uh, Who or not? This computer, uh, this is the uh, or the you know the the world. Um, as an alternative to procedural content generation, you don't have uh, that expert design, you a person that expert knowledge, or you don't want of inputting that into the uh, that using machine learning instead uh, to instead uh, DG algorithms. And this has been uh, one of the most common applications of knowledge extraction from games, uh, a few from uh, Sam uh, uh, and from Adam Somerville. Um, so, but there's a problem here. Uh, and the problem is there's a limited amount of content for a single game or series. Uh, most machine learning approaches are thousands and hundreds of thousands of elements of data to be able to get good results. Um, and you have 32 levels in the original Super Mario Brothers. Um, so that's um, the second problem is that in learning we're going to trick your output but we're to see distribution that uh, but in uh, creative fields like state design, we often want to see things that are more extreme, more different uh, from our original distribution, uh, more surprising. Uh, so here's the pitch for for how we sort of try to these things together out of the computational creativity field called combinational uh, lots of C's. Um, the big idea here is that we can do recombination to generate out new knowledge. Uh, I realize this, this is a fairly dense figure. Uh, I'm going to break it apart sort of piece by piece uh, in here. So uh, for input, we're typically seeing hand authored input uh, for these types of techniques uh, because they tend to require sort of nice structure that's consistent across all your different kinds of input. Um, the variables tend to be uh, ordinal or symbolic. Uh, they do not tend to be numeric. Uh, and that means that they don't tend to work really well with sort of modern machine learning, statistical machine learning methods. Um, but so here's two examples of input that I'll just sort of use throughout this section. Uh, and this one here is a sort of concept graph for a house. Uh, this can be read as a resident lives in a house on land. And the second input is a concept graph for a boat. It can be read as a passenger rides in a boat on water. Hopefully that checks out. Uh, so there's a few different approaches I'll walk through. Uh, there's actually a lot more than I'm going to walk through right here. Uh, you can read the paper. I think I do a fairly good job of surveying the sort of field. Uh, but these are, are some of the most popular and also um, the, the most distinct in terms of what they do, uh, which is helpful for me. So there's conceptual blending. Uh, uh, Adapted this figure from Bakunia and Turner from 1998. The big idea of conceptual blending is for our two input spaces, we're going to map similar things and then uh, we're going to basically combine them together. So you can do things like uh, create 3D models, um, go from a wolf and a, a horse to a werehorse or a werewolf to a, a werehorse. Um, and with our two input spaces, we can do things like, say, a resident passenger that lives in and rides in a houseboat on the water. So we've sort of invented the concept of a houseboat. Um, from our two input spaces. So that's cool. Um, an amalgamation instead, or an amalgam, uh, is the notion of trying to make the, the uh, easiest combination, the combination that doesn't make use of any uh, from both input spaces as possible. Um, so the, the notion here is we're, we're trying to like look through the spaces of possible generalizations, the, the sort of total union being up here um, to find something that is sort of the least cost uh, 
to get to. And what this functionally means is we're just going to swap out values of each variable. So we can get a resident lives in a boat on land, uh, but we can't get any of these sort of blended values, uh, combination of values. Uh, compositional adaption. Um, and this is a very technical, uh, look at that very technical figure I have. Um, the big idea for compositional adaption is you're going to basically piece together pieces of code or values or variables um, based on the learned relationships or, or relationships you've seen before. Um, and what this functionally means is we can get things like adaptions, but we can also get minimal concepts. So things that are smaller than both input spaces. So like a house on water, uh, for example. And last but not least, uh, introducing conceptual expansion. Um, uh, conceptual expansion, you can think of as sort of a blend <laughs> of uh, conceptual blending and compositional adaption. Uh, what it's functionally doing is you have a set of essentially filters uh, on your input that say what pieces to take. So for example, here you have these filters, these three here, and then the inputs, these three faces. And by taking out just the pieces we care about, we can create a brand new thing. Um, but what this means for, for us in this particular example is we can do sort of both the blending and the minimal space of compositional adaptions. We can create like a houseboat on land, for example. You crack your houseboat into the shore, maybe. Uh, so if we're going to uh, create a very unscientific figure to try to explain the, the difference of the spaces uh, between these different approaches, uh, you can see our two inputs here, M1 and M2. Uh, we can think of amalgamation as being the sort of center uh, fit here where we're going to interpolate between the two spaces. Uh, conceptual blends instead are going to extrapolate from the two spaces. Compositional adaption will uh, keep generally the same level of complex or the same level of um, uh, variables, the same number of variables, but change the model complexity uh, from both approaches. And uh, with conceptual expansion, we should technically be able to do this whole thing, this whole space. So let's take uh, a look at a case study uh, in case I haven't sold you on, on these approaches and what we can potentially do. Uh, so if you recall, at the beginning of this talk, I talked about uh, the desire to uh, take uh, our limited amount of, of training data and to be able to get more creative machine learned models out of that. So for example, we could take a machine learned model capable of generating underwater levels from Super Mario Brothers and a machine learned model capable of generating boss levels from Super Mario, Brother, uh, Super Mario Brothers and smush them together with these different techniques to be able to create things like an underwater boss level. So something that's totally new, that's, that doesn't exist in, any, in anything before. Um, uh, for input for this case study, we're going to use probabilistic graphical models of level design. Um, they look like this in a somewhat simplified format. Uh, it's this notion of nodes with edge relationships. Uh, notably, in the actual models, these edges have weights on them, but we're removing them because, uh, as I said at the top, most of these compositional uh, 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 creativity techniques do not handle numbers well. So we're just going to go with relationships and nodes. Um, this is a, a figure I've extracted from gave a little generation from gameplay video, a prior paper of ours, um, to give you a high level notion of where these models come from. Um, but I'm not going to dive crazy in deep, and so I'm not going to like fully expand this figure in the way I normally would. Uh, but the general idea is we extract these models from uh, a gameplay video of someone actually playing a game uh, with a sprite sheet. Uh, we smush frames together to be able to get geometry of a level. We categorize this geometry according to uh, k-means clustering uh, with k estimated using the distortion ratio. And that lets us get some notion of like types of levels. So for example, here is a, a final clustering. These are median chunks of levels. Um, so you can see you have sort of boss levels on this side, you have underground levels on this side, tree top levels over here, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then we build up this, this probabilistic graphical model, which of course I'm doing the most hand waving here because I'm not going to actually explain how we do this. Um, but at the end of the day, we can represent it uh, in this format here. Um, so as input, we're going to take five of these models um, representing the five sort of Super Mario Brother level types that exist. Um, so each of these is not just a, a level. Each of these is itself a generative model. We could use this to create new levels, each one of these. Um, but nicely, they look like graphs. And that's nice because all the combinational creativity techniques are meant to work on. Uh, so that's a, a pleasant sort of thing that we can we can make use of here. Uh, so here are the five level types. We have above ground levels. We're going to be using this graph here. Uh, boss level, we're going to use this level, uh, this graph here. And then I'm not showing you the graphs for these, but we're using one for treetop levels, um, underground levels, and underwater levels. All right. 
Uh, so we're going to be using two different measurements uh, to actually try to summarize these models. As, as you might expect, we can produce many, many uh, outputs, and so we need some way of sort of uh, uh, getting a general notion of how they perform. One is playability, so what percentage of the generated levels can an A-star agent complete? So we have each level generate or each uh, uh, blended model generate 100 levels and then see if an A-star agent can complete them. And novelty, how distinct is the generated graph from the input graph? So some notion of just graph distance normalized across the maximum possible distance. All right, so using these different techniques, we can get these this style of graph out of it. Um, these are for the, the two graph inputs that I've shown you already. Uh, so uh, amalgams, as I said before, uh, what it does is it sort of just swaps out different values. Um, and then what this means is you end up with something where, oh, okay, I'm going to be able to uh, put a, a tree here or a cloud up here uh, in a generated level. Um, blending uh, smushes uh, different values together. Uh, I didn't uh, go ahead and give it the ability to actually like combine visually these things. So you just end up with sort of this wonky generated output where you have like blocks and ground in the sky. Uh, composition, as I said before, is this notion of I'm just going to take things that already exist uh, and put them together in a new form that's potentially minimal to existing graphs or the to input graphs. So you can get something like this. Um, expansion is similar, except you get this sort of combination thing happening again with blends. You can get something like that. And I also uh, made use of a random baseline, uh, which is just irrespective of anything, just smush things together in all possible ways, uh, just to get a sense of, of how these things perform over like a very naive approach. And so you get sort of garbage that looks like that. All right, so beyond the sort of qualitative results, we can also look at these things uh, quantitatively. Uh, so this is the all possible combinations uh, for all five of the input sort of possible pairs we have. Um, so uh, amalgams, blends, and compositions may not look uh, particularly distinct when compared to the, the massive number of output you can get just doing this randomly. Um, but notably, uh, blends and compositions are significantly larger in terms of their output space than amalgams. Um, expansions are obviously significantly larger than both of these, and then random is going to be way, way, way bigger than anything else. Uh, it's going to be huge because it's just random. We're not making use of any of our existing knowledge when we're doing this combination. Uh, we're also going to use uh, here the notion of an expressive range. Uh, this is a technique from Jillian Smith. Uh, to look at basically plotting the output of generators. So I'm plotting the output of these, these, uh, these combination techniques based on the model. So in this case, the y-axis is uh, our novelty axis. So higher up is more novel, lower is less novel, and our x-axis is how playable. Uh, so in general, you can see that amalgams tend to be just sort of mid-range of novelty. Um, that makes sense. We're just sort of swapping out different values. You're not going to get graphs too different from our input um, in a sort of range of playability as well. Um, with blends, we have more of a density around higher uh, playability, which is good. Um, uh, but we also have a lot that are just not playable at all. And they're also going to be slightly more novel than amalgams. So that sort of follows the intuitions here. Um, compositions have a major trend toward being more novel um, and being more playable, uh, which is cool. And this is generally because uh, in terms of novelty, for the first time, we can have graphs that are minimal from our, our two input graphs, so smaller graphs, which means that we're just going to get more things that are weirder and more different. Um, expansions, interestingly, we can sort of look at this as being a literal combination of the blends and composition space, uh, which works out with the intuition I gave you earlier that these are sort of a, a combination of these two spaces. You can like literally see the, the sort of middle uh, bit here and the sort of general shape there. Um, and then random is, of course, all over the place, though notably it has a slight skew towards being playable um, and, of course, being novel because it's random. Uh, but the, the playability skew is just because both of the input graphs produced playable output, uh, which means that in general you're going to get more likely to get things that are playable than not playable. Um, notably, also, well, this does not call it, uh, this is not uh, covered in the qualitative or quantitative output, we can see from the qualitative output that the random graphs, even if they produce playable outputs, like this is technically playable, um, it doesn't look ideal um, or doesn't really fit our understanding of Super Mario Brothers. Okay, uh, so uh, I also wanted to go ahead and give the total number of high playability and high novelty, which I just defined as the uh, greater than 0 0.5 uh, for both, both sort of are, uh, are normalized. 
so amalgams, oh, I was supposed to put the ratios on here. Uh, let's pretend that I did that at 1 a.m. last night when I did the rest of these slides. Um, but uh, you can get a sense generally of, so amalgams, you're gonna have a very low percentage here uh, with blends slightly higher, uh, compositions slightly higher than that. Uh, with expansions, you're gonna get a lower percentage than either blends or compositions of these sort of high playability, high novelty, but notably you get way more of them. Uh, and random, you're gonna get the least number except for amalgams and way, way, way more. Um, but there's just way more of them anyway. So it means that if you were gonna just combine them randomly, you'd have to do significantly more search or significantly more optimization to be able to find anything worth doing. So these, these approaches are, do have benefits over just doing it randomly. Uh, so in terms of comparison between these different approaches, we can think about it in terms of uh, amalgams are gonna give us few examples with relatively low novelty, uh, but maybe that's okay. Maybe we want things that are more like the, uh, the input for certain domains. Uh, blends are gonna give you mostly higher quality with medium sort of novelty. Um, compositions are gonna give you both high value and high novelty, um, but they're gonna have, they're going to throw out a lot of stuff as well. So that may not work for all domains. And expansions are gonna give you high novelty and sort of a median uh, value, but you're gonna get lots of these on the output. So uh, you can think of, of cases where you might wanna use each of these in the future. All right, I wanna say a brief thanks to the NSF uh, for supporting this work. Thanks NSF uh, and open the floor for any questions you might have. Thanks. Oh, playability. So we, we literally have an A star agent, uh, and we just have it traced through outputted chunks of levels uh, for each model. So given, uh, I didn't go through the generation technique from here for each of these, these models, but if you want, there's another whole paper that you can read on that subject. Uh, but we just have each model output like 100 levels and have the A star agent try to get the model, and then each level's percentage point uh, in terms of uh, its overall playability. Yeah. I'm sorry. Did you collaborate with Nintendo? No, uh, Nintendo doesn't really do that. Uh, no, we just, uh, so we, uh, so for this specific work, we used um, uh, gameplay video uh, as the input. So we didn't have actual true levels uh, at all. Uh, and we just sort of made it up, grabbed the, the level geometry by squishing frames together. Um, uh, in other work, though, there's corpuses like um, the video game Level Corpus, um, which you can find on GitHub, it's publicly accessible, uh, and they have uh, ASCII representations of levels, uh, so easier to parse representations of. Any questions? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> at the start of this, you kind of motivated it by talking about uh, procedural content generation and maybe <clears throat> authors who know an idea of like, game design that they want to implement or are trying to do that. Right. Um, for the future of this work, how do you see, are you planning to integrate that in procedural gener content generation stuff? Or how do you see that working with human designers or, or AI designers, or where do you see this going? Basically? Yeah, great question. Um, so this is actually motivated by an interest I have in automated game design. Um, so uh, if I were giving you a slightly different talk, you would see that we have, um, in addition to models of level design for games, we can do um, a uh, similar thing, well, Joe brought it up in the intro, uh, we do a similar thing to extract um, uh, transition functions and rules for games from gameplay video. Uh, so if we have rules and if we have a model of the level design and we have all of the art because we need it to do both of those two things, uh, then we essentially have a representation of the entire game, right? And then if you now have that representation for multiple games, uh, you can think about, oh, I've now defined sort of a space of possible games, right? right? Uh, but if I were to use like these, this knowledge extract in this way for a typical sort of machine learning approach is like, oh, I have two or three games, like, oh, that's not gonna work so well. Uh, that was sort of the motivating factor about like introducing uh, these sorts of methods where we can uh, think about, uh, given this sort of space of possible games, this gives us a, a way of, of searching that space or using other methods to look throughout that space. Good question. Any other questions? Yeah, so I guess I'm blown line. This is really cool stuff. Um, Thanks. I guess the one thing I am curious about, um, I guess following a little bit on what John was saying, is like with the future direction of procedural generation, I know, um, so all these, so Mario especially is a platformer game, and mm -hmm. a lot of those have a very, I guess, simple, I guess, underlying semantic goal in the game, where it's just get from the left screen to the right screen. Right. Throughout this, so I guess, do you think these things can also, because your examples earlier were talking about things like the boats and where they could be, 
So do you think you can look at the other jobs where there's different mechanics or goals that are driving the design and levels? Yeah, that's a great question. So I didn't get into it in this um, presentation, uh, but one of the, the key notions of uh, these four techniques is that they require some, well, I guess I talked about it a little bit, um, some mapping of input. So you have to have some notion of how similar things are between input. Um, and there's many different ways of doing this, like uh, analogical reasoning. Obviously, if you're just going to do like a simple distance function, you can hand off that yourself. It might be a bit independent. As long as some notion of mapping things from one domain, one domain of games to another domain of games, then it should be able to still give you relatively reasonable output. Okay. Uh, but that may require some you know, knowledge engineering in terms of coming up with a, a mapping function for that, the specific sort of two different domains. Any other questions? I guess this is just like kind of like a <clears throat> human quality question, but um, did you did you find that generated any really cool unique ones that um, looked like really fun to play? <laughs> um, so I didn't physically look at many of them uh, just because <laughs> like we're talking about for the random one I didn't actually give you pure numbers which I meant to, uh, but uh, I'm going the wrong direction. Uh, for the random one, you know, we're talking about like thousand or something like this, uh, like a massive uh, number of, of output levels. Um, so it's just unreasonable to look through those. Uh, I think the, the coolest ones to me are probably like the visions and cool because it's not um, stuck to like the existing inputs. Uh, you get all sorts of weird and things as I like, don't know. Uh, I gave to like motivate the case study. Uh, this is actually from an earlier approach that we uh, did where we just looked at using a, a, a conceptual blending on, on input levels. So this is an actual output. Uh, um, it's an output uh, level from an output level, which is blend. Uh, so I think that one's really cool. That's why this is a motivating example. Question, anybody else? So, so you mentioned I. Oh, yeah. So you mentioned a, a, a limitation of these uh, kind of graph-based combinational creativity mm -hmm. techniques is that they're only symbolic, like they don't address right. numeric values or weights. Um, do you feel like you can take the method that exists further, or do you feel like in order to continue on this kind of trajectory, mm -hmm. you need to look at like a continuous relaxation of these? Right. So that's. Uh... That's why we introduced this technique, um, mm -hmm. because so right here we're doing basically like zero and ones only. But you can imagine instead like mm -hmm. these filters could be grayscale, right? Um, there's no there's no reason why we have to use only zeros and ones here, um, and because of the setup, I mean it's literally doing in this case like you know element wise matrix multiplication and then something over the results. Mm -hmm. um, that could be anything. These could be vectors. They could be individual numbers. Um, and uh, we submitted a paper to Ijkai, fingers crossed about that one, which I was telling you about over breakfast, and you know about this, though, people don't know about this, uh, where we're looking at applying this to uh, neural nets as well. Uh, so you can do a similar sort of blending thing um, or combination thing uh, with these sort of more numeric approaches. All right, cool. OK, so um, maybe now is a good time for the next presenter to, uh, to get set up. Yeah, uh, uh, I'll leave this whole thing. Do you want to come and grab your? Laptop. Yeah. The next paper is uh, roles that plan activity and intent recognition with planning can play in games. Right. VGA. Um, oh, I have to make that first request by about seven minutes on the schedule. Just in case. So if you have any other questions for Matthew, please feel free. Yeah. Uh, I'm sitting here now and I've had water, so I can talk for ages. I don't, I don't, I want to, you know, okay, I guess I have to, a little bit. this is not, I have to babysit this. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's why I was sitting there before. Sorry, no, we're getting it, wake it up and stuff. Perfectly fine. There's plenty of time. No rush. <laughs> Even if it's too complicated. Yeah, it is. It is. Like, how are you doing video? Oh, that little thing there. That okay. little thing there. This is why we're not all using Android.
Yeah, we're re we're requesting. That would be a good idea, though. Yeah, I mean, had we we thought ahead, we were requested things like you know audio in cords and audio add cords, and we didn't get these things. So uh, we've we've got a MacGyver to solution. <laughs> oh, if anybody feels uncomfortable being live streamed, please let me know. Uh, we can we can pause the live stream. Yeah, and on the theme of you know sparking collaborations, uh, as as we said, there's there's a bunch of different institutions represented here too: uh, Georgia Tech, UC Santa Cruz, uh, have large contingents. I know there's a there's a group from Brigham. Uh, I I'm I'm pleased with how many different uh, institutions are represented here. Always something. <laughs> um, so it's up to you if you want to get started a few minutes early. That's totally fine. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean it's. Yeah. All right, cool. So thank you guys very much for having us, by the way. It is really exciting. And thank you guys for all being here. I'm Rick Friedman. I'm at University of Massachusetts. I'm going to talk about some of the work along my team with my advisor, uh, Shlomo Zilberstein. And in particular, they will talk about, um, so I'm going to apologize. It's a hard to um, parse title. I'm going to apologize. I didn't realize you guys were going to be putting out pictures and I could have sent you guys something otherwise. <laughs> But um, the roles that activity, plan activity and attend recognition with planning, planning games. And this idea stems from, um, so my lab actually focuses a lot in decision making and autonomously doing that under resource constraints. So normally looking at any time planning and stuff. And the way I decided to uh, take a spin on this was I got really motivated to interact. Uh, in this concept video that I used to explain what we're trying, um, this is with uh, the robotics lab we work with. Um, and so my colleague, Ite Jung over here, is watching as I'm trying to clean up this room. And when he notices boxes that are blocking my path, he actually takes the remote control and decides how to drive the robot over to pick these boxes and carry them away so that I can finish the task in the room. And so the big thing here is that he's actually doing this is watching what I'm doing. From this, he's figuring out that I'm trying to do a task and what the overall ideas of cleaning up the room. And then he figures out that the way he can best help is by getting rid of these obstacles that are blocking my path. And then he figures out how to use the remote control to actually take the robot around and clear the path so that I can finish the cleaning task. And so all these decisions for interaction are being done by him. And my goal is to move this so it can be done more autonomously, like on the robot and such. But interaction isn't just limited to working with robotics. I mean, of course, there is things like therapy and the robots are helping out in stores. Thing has been to Japan, they answer the pepper robots in every soft bag now that help you to buy cell phones. Um, and then there's also like robotic um, like pets, but even some of those cars now have um, systems in them. So like you have to have interaction between the driver and the car as you're taking turns between who's actually in control. And even with on-screen monitors, dialogue systems, and then of course, video games. And so this interaction thing is everywhere in the world today. And I really want to move just looking at the robotics because we have the access to, to other resources. And so I think video games is a great domain. And the problem with a lot of these things, especially the access and the biggest point for the frameworks I talk about is because of the interaction. So for those who are familiar with things like open, you wind it up, you put it down, and it sort of goes on further with interaction. Um, like it'll go off wherever it wants to stop. If it happens to go over the table, it'll fall off. It doesn't quite catch itself. And this creates a contract that even a lot of our current systems they have. With Siri, you can only give it a fixed set of inputs. With say, it tries to run a search for you. So it listens for things. And then even in the older days of Clippy, apps, once it recognizes what's going on, the dialogue tree it creates to work with you on the And so we're really considering this whole Interaction with thinking about everything. And this can lead to issues where it doesn't even consider context. I'm sure many of you guys have seen the fun and fit loop joke with you plug a Siri and like they're just doing what they're told in the interaction. They're not really keeping track. And this gets into the what you can do. And that interaction should close with interact with their environment. 
and they pretty respond. So the fact that are recognizing when we have the other agents involved, whether it be human or being interacting with the environment and that's running ahead. So we don't wait for that queue to run Siri. We don't just give a fixed dialogue tree and then wait for someone to click on a box. But it's actually thinking about what the other agent is thinking and doing and thus responding on that. And I think the best way where this applies within games is actually from some work that I did with one of the undergraduates who worked with me on his audience about two years ago. And when he came to me, he's in game people, I do game design classes at you, which is where I actually met the student. plays competitively in Street Fighter and Tekken areas. So for those who are familiar with fighter games, you usually have two characters on the screen, and using a lot of button combinations um, that you hit really fast and really hard, it creates various fighting mechanics. So you can actually battle another person with a diverse set of moves, and you try to essentially take all their health away as quickly as possible. I think that's the easiest way to describe it quickly. But the thing you point out is when you're playing tournaments, you actually can't play against the computer for any practice or training. You really have to play against another person because all the different combinations and the different strategies that are being done aren't really followed in the computer much. And so it leads into this question of why do we get such a different experience from the player side if we play against a computer versus playing with another person? And it really does show the open versus closed loop method. A lot of fighting games, for example, do run on expert systems, a finite state machine or something about design, where it figures out what we're essentially simply looks at the state of the world. It looks at where the two characters are and what moves might have just been pressed, and then decides based on that. It doesn't think about any strategy the opponent's trying to use. It doesn't consider what the player's doing. But when you go against another human, they can recognize if you're playing defensively, offensively, if you're going in with a certain maneuver, and then they can respond accordingly. And that creates a very different thing. It's also a huge thing. Um, we were just talking about speed. And while it is a really fun thing, and it's a really cool idea for a planning problem, mm -hmm. it's also a good sign of why open loop is there. Because a lot of the speedrunners, if you've ever watched them, they figure out how to manipulate the game state and in a position to respond a certain way, it makes it easier to clear and pass through some levels. And that's actually a lot of things. They get into a rhythm. They figure out if I time my button press here, the game's going to respond to anything else I can get through faster. And even with a lot of things like the early Pac Man goes, you know, they all follow certain algorithms. And so you can eventually figure out these algorithms they use and then just work around them. Of course, it's still difficult. It doesn't necessarily mean open loop is easy to get around. It's just that it's predictable and it doesn't really consider the other player. And thus, the main thing I've been working with is trying to actually integrate planning and all this, put all the different recognition forms together into one for now. But the overall quick idea of the system is usually you have some kind of sensor, especially with robots. But even a lot of uh, games today are starting to involve sensors. We have reality. We have the Kinect sensors. And your phones have a lot of things in them that can read what you're doing in the world you're playing a game. And the sensor data can be processed through activity recognition, which sort of gets a high level description. What am I actually trying to, what am I actually doing? And from once it knows these ideas of what's being done, it can look at plan recognition, or what's the high-level task that's being completed. And once it can predict the high-level task, it can start to do a plan recognition of what's next. And if you come next, what you're currently doing and what your high-level goal is, you can actually start to make some basic decisions in the planning process. And then, of course, you actually would start to execute or perform some of these tasks that you've uh, planned in your decision making. And, and this leads into a plan recognition that's going to be coming next to the consequences of action I made. And if things are following as I expect, then great. Then we are continuing through, we can keep going. And if there's something wrong, we'll notice that we recognize something that we predicted from our action. And that tells us we should start recognizing again to continue on this process. And so this is what we're trying to do. And I think today we'll focus mostly on, because the sensors aren't uh, quite as common in a lot of games and execution varies depending on what game you have, we'll focus more on getting from plan recognition and planning and seeing where those come together. And hence where a lot of the title came from. And so quick background, I'm not sure what AI backgrounds we all have, so I'm going to quickly go over a little bit of this. But uh, planning looks at the idea of the automated problem solving. And the earlier days of looking at this was simply saying we have some initial state of the world, like what we currently are in now, where everyone's sitting in their chairs and we're here. You then have some goal state or what the world should look like when the task is finished. So maybe if we're going to all get out of here because I'm going to be a terrible talk, maybe the goal state is for the room to be empty and for me to just be standing here alone. And so we would want to find some sequence of actions that can get us there. And by doing these actions, we know the world itself. And if we can find some path that gets us from that initial state to the goal state we want the world to look like, we actually have a sequence of actions, and we thus know what we need to do in the state. 
sorry, we need to do in the world in order to complete our task. And these essentially can even be game theoretic and even applying uncertainty. I don't talk about those as much here because planning is a huge field. Like I said, it's one of the earliest in AI and our lab's done a lot with these, but they are other options for you guys to look at. But we'll use this, this one for now because that's what we'll be looking at is some basic ideas. And plan recognition, there was a much, much newer area. It got founded around 2011-ish. And there is actually a plan recognition workshop tomorrow as well. If people do find this stuff interesting and want to hear more about it. But the main idea is it actually inverts the problem. So instead of being given the task as an initial goal state and trying to find the actions, we actually know the action someone was doing, but we don't know anything about the task itself. And usually in the earlier days, we essentially made a plan library that would just look through and try to play a matching game. So for example, if we were to apply some form of weighted inference, you might see someone get out of bed, go to the bathroom and clean the dishes. And for a list of pre-computed solutions you already have, you find that it matches murdering in the shower. But if you look a little bit deeper, you also find a morning routine. The so morning routine is probably more likely, and that would have been from hand-made knowledge engineering. And so you'd say that this is probably the like, task that was trying to be done, was the morning routine. On the other hand, if you did notice someone bearing a body, you can go ahead and change your weights a little bit as well. Uh, another common technique that's been used a lot um, and actually appears a lot in game literature as well, so some of you might recognize with hierarchical task networks, where essentially you start off with uh, some lower level sequence, and you can think of it like a natural language sentence. And just like how you can parse it for different parts of speech, you can find higher level tasks that describe the lower level tasks you see, and you continue this process till you get to the highest level tasks you're trying to recognize. Actually, we did some of this mission last year at AAAI was based on something called the Ramirez Geffner method, where they actually run planners to simulate. We see an agent uh, just participation because this is action, of course. Where do you guys think this guy's trying to walk? A through F. Hey. All right, good. So we're all thinking the same thing. And this is the natural human intuition that agents are trying to be as optimal as possible. Like we don't just waste time doing things. And so if we were to simulate a plan from this point that we've taken so far to go to A, B, all the way through F, we find it's most optimal in the plans to go toward A, and we can even spend our distribution. And as we watch more observations be made, we can actually watch the evolution of these probabilistic um, evaluations based on how optimal the other plans are from what's been done so far. And use the simulation to this way thing and figure out how likely different plans are um, based on the observations you currently have. And we extended this work at last year AAAI to actually show we can actually do interaction part one. Because all that work was done as a post-processing step. So say we just care about the recognition. But if we want to plan to do something with you, we can't wait till the interaction's complete to actually start interacting. And what we do is we found out that even if you don't know which goal necessarily kept changing the probabilities along the way, you can start to find something that we would call necessities or just how likely certain subconditions are. So in the grid world, there's not too much variety. But in something like uh, blocks world, where you're trying to stack blocks and spell a word, it could be any of them from this list. If they're trying to spell master, then by the time we see the agent here, we can actually look at the Ramirez Geffner weightings and see that that's the most likely word. <coughs> but if we look at these necessities of which features are most common between the different goals, we find that R should always be on the bottom, E should be on top of R, and getting the more interesting ones like S on top of T. But we also see that because of how many different goals we had in their weightings, despite Foster being the most likely, it actually says that A on top of S is a much more necessary condition to satisfy all the different goals we're being seen. And with this information, we can actually start to do an interaction, even if we don't have all the observations for the completed execution sequence yet. And this is actually where we start to get into different kinds of behaviors as well, depending on your agent type of being assistive, independent, or adversarial. And we're going to go into a look how these actually play into games now, since I've talked about at the beginning, games are important. I've now put games back into it. And so if we think about adversarial agents. These are your stereotypical enemy role. Their goal is really just to stop the player from making progress in the game. And usually you have a variety of these to give players evolutionary constraints as they're playing the game to learn about different enemy mechanics. And usually these have been done by the finite state machines we talked about earlier. And even more recently, they've been creating behavior trees. So it's still human engineered and it's very complex. And the main reason they seem like a variety is you just plug in different function pointers for different behaviors. I think one of the big examples that was actually talked about on Gamma Sutra and AI Game Dev a few years ago was when Halo had first done this approach, they actually created essentially the same structure for every enemy in the game. 
the players to different behaviors were different. Everyone, there was a variety of characters in the game. Like some of them had a retreating behavior, some would point retreating to null, and that would create a variety of whether a character would ever be run away at the levels or if they just never ran away at all. And in ways, they would charge. So it still creates this uh, variety of behavior, but the thing is, these were all still very fixed and based on the game state. But if we were to actually include plan recognition or somebody you know, we to start to this strategy. So for example, we could actually create experience consequence players. So if they have a keto, instead of relying on the fact that the character exit door and the robot or some opponent might come charging at you to try to prevent you from getting out of the level, they may run towards the treasure chest, which is the choice whether it's worth the extra challenge to get the bonus treasure you want, or if you should just take the easy way out of the level. And so this actually starts now based on what they've accomplished so far and gives them a new layer of uh, choices and experience and what happens from the choice. Same way, you can also try to reverse repetitive patterns. So like we said, we usually figure out how to manipulate the game state. But if you start to eventually recognize that the player is doing a lot of things, such as maybe jumping over the enemy as they can you, then they may also learn to raise their hands or do something to actually block you from your typical jumping behavior. And so these adaptations actually add new layers to what the player does instead of just In the same way, assistive characters. Um, they're not as common in a lot of games, but they definitely aid with tagging along. And a lot of times they're scripted to avoid getting in the way while still doing something to be there in the game. The earliest examples we can think about is if anyone has played Sonic the Hedgehog 2, I'm guessing by your time, you've definitely played it. Um, so Chaos is one of the other buddy characters I could think of in early games, and it simply did a delay from the original button presses on your controller, unless you had a front time on the second person controller. But the key thing is for that one player experience alone, the buddy was just simply delaying whatever you did. And even in more sophisticated games like The Last of Us that's been out, where Ellie actually got a lot of awards for being a great buddy character, when they gave a talk at the Game Developers Conference on how that was created, they even mentioned that it was just a lot more engineering for her. They spent a lot longer. They figured out much better patterns to give her to make her not get in your way when they're walking around, but also told her things to say. And they gave her different control for when to battle and such. So that way it really felt she was being realistic. But still, in every way, it was actually engineered. And the main thing, though, is based on that, it was still game state. And the thing is, if we actually consider what the player was really doing, we can actually what the player is doing and actually plan some responses based on that. So, for example, if, um, the, sorry, I just have one sprite. So we're going to make them both the enemies and previous and the friends now. But for example, if they notice you're going to do something like get the key, it can actually plan ahead to realize you might be trying to open that treasure chest. And then it could bring you the treasure chest, or it could even do other things to allow you to make this task even easier. And in the same way, it can even recognize things like when you're trying to run off to accomplish a task. <laughs> and this is definitely a big thing with a lot of the buddy characters is they don't always recognize when you're trying to do something, they either do it for you or they just don't help you with what you were expecting them to do. But you can imagine if it can recognize trying to accomplish some task or flee from some enemy, if the character, um, of course, you don't want them to commit suicide, but if they have enough help, they can hold off the enemy or they can distract them while you try to push your great the game. This would be a great chance to play with it once it recognizes where you're actually going. And the fact that the enemies might be an obstacle for you to complete that check task. Uh, the last type of interaction we'll talk about is the independent agents. And these are the NPCs or couple characters. This is pretty much everything that's usually not a buddy or an adversary in the games. And these are not very common in some games, like the fighting games we mentioned earlier clearly have no NPCs at all because it's just two players fighting each other. But in a lot of other more complex um, environment design games, such as role-playing games, usually NPCs are the majority of the players that are found in there. And these agents are usually just go around, they add scale and personality to the world. There's feeling it makes you can see where the player feels like they are a part of this thing with many other characters around it. And a lot of times these have been very static because programming so many things is very difficult. And NPC AI, I definitely have heard is, you guys programming some of the gay AI not as much, but it sounds like NPC AI is becoming one of the hotter areas right now because of that challenge. And so the big thing with these would be we can do planning and recognition to acknowledge the player while doing your independent actions. It's not much, but it does actually mean something when players try to do something like go for a certain item. And if you have the choice to walk and get in the player's way or walk around them to still accomplish your task of getting to the exit independently, you might as well avoid the player in that case. And it actually shows that you care about them, you're not blocking their way. And in the same way, you can even have a lot of this dynamic adaptive audio um, dialogue and such. And these are the basic ideas for how agents can play a role in the game. And the last one we'll quickly go into is even the game. 
And the big thing here is if we can recognize what the player is doing, even the game can modify itself based on the player's behavior. And the biggest thing here is making sure that content is provided as the way that the designers may have intended, um, and even personalizing player experience. So for example, um, as they're going through the levels, you might have to be able to recognize difficulty because certain action patterns might be more common and easier for one player than another. You can actually rearrange it so that you don't have a bad difficulty curve where the first levels are hard and the ones are easy based on the mechanics that are used. You might be able to adapt it that way. And even sandbox <coughs> games can avoid linear storytelling because you can figure out what other characters are trying to accomplish. And based on where they're going, you can add the story element to fit into those worlds. So I'm going to work by Rydell on how to create these story elements through planning and such. We recognize where we'll figure out what constraints we should apply to the planner to make sure it fits in with where the player is rather than making them go all the way across the map to somewhere else. And the last one, since I keep all of the game design class, I've gotten really, really interested in uh, procedural content, especially with the meat that goes in the game. So dynamic audio and dynamic graphics and such. And this can lead to questions of like, if we make custom levels, can we figure out like how the player acts and thus create these custom levels in that sense to make it a player-based level? And also, can we create new uh, ways of applying the background music and even characters and objects based on what the players are doing? Can we build those characters based on how the player plays so that the enemies or the new characters that are in the level or even how the music is being changed by the player's ways are all based on these methods rather than just the games affecting how the music is being played out. So in quick summary, um, we're showing uh, hopefully that planning a mission to some of the formalisms and the things they share. This is you know, being a respective player. And in that sense, we can hopefully act from the player and even figure out how to acknowledge what they're doing in the world and act around them in that way. And probably even having the game respond to the player in the same way to create the game. And so with that, I'll quickly go ahead and thank a lot of people, um, my undergraduate and master's students who have worked with me over the years, uh, my current lab mates, all the robotics lab people who have definitely gotten me involved in this, and uh, Alice Fukunaga at University of Tokyo, who worked with me for a summer and actually got us a lot of the early work on figuring out these together. Um, Ite Jung, who you saw in the video, was one of the earlier guys who got me into human robotic action in the first place, and Josh Tracy Newman, who is actually an independent role game designer for a lot of his feedback as I've been working on this process. And so with that, thank you guys all for your time. Uh, cool talk. Uh, so one of the the uh, big sort of uh, limitations on triple AI or not triple AI triple A game AI rather uh, is that uh, all the like computation time goes to graphics. So mm -hmm. the AI ends up with very little computation time. So I'm wondering what the sort of computational running time of this process is. Right, and that is an excellent question. Um, and actually, I guess to get some specific statistics, uh, I guess about three years ago, uh, Kevin Dill was here for the What's Hot in AWIDE. And he apparently worked on the Red Dead Redemption AI as well. And he had actually mentioned specifically that they only get 20% of the computation resources for mm -hmm. everything but graphics. Yeah. And they have to run at 60 frames per second. So you're right, AI has been really hard for that. And unfortunately, this currently is not up to snuff um, mm -hmm. to be able to run in a real game. But uh, tomorrow at the pair workshop, we'll talk about one method we're doing so that the necessity computations are getting drastically reduced um, in their runtime. So before it was taking a few hours to run one example, and it's being projected to go down, it still won't be that good. It'll still take a few minutes, but it's at least a larger drop in its runtime rate. Um, and that's based on trying not to run all the searches at once based on the shared state space principle that they have. Um, but you're right, so this still isn't fast enough, but I think if people are interested enough in getting in the area, they might get enough minds together and oh, definitely open up a challenge to everyone else to figure out, can we make these things run faster? Because especially if we do recognition as a form of planning, you're running all these extra planning problems and planning itself can take 30 seconds a lot of the times, which is why there are quicker algorithms like JPS plus for faster um, motion planning and such. Mm -hmm. And so, no, you're right. That's a good question. And I guess that's why we're throwing out the idea, but we don't have any games to prove it in yet. <laughs> cool. Thank you for your talk. Um, so uh, I have an idea to push this even further, which I'm interested in having your thoughts on. So, so even in the work you presented, which uh, seems like a, a good improvement on current state of how things are done, but one could argue that um, it's, it, it is still a static process in that um, it, the, the rules are more sophisticated, uh, but in a sense, like if I, if I say start playing a game uh, for a couple of months and then hand the car game cartridge to a friend, um, that cartridge is interchangeable with that, that friend's cartridge in, in the sense that um, the, the, the rules will remain the same, so no matter how big the rules 
you know, saying they, they once they're baked into the game, they they they, they are static. But one could think of um, having uh, having these rules evolve over time, uh, either through learning or through some uh, evolution mechanism that that would, uh, uh, for instance, if, if we're talking about speed running, um, and um, uh, you, you talk about these uh, these runners that exploit the, the the repetitive behaviors and having that that game behavior change over time might actually break some of these these structures that we've been developing. Um, end of question. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I mean you are absolutely right. I think it would it would be a problem for speedrunners. So you're right. Every player experience is based on different motivations, and so. Unfortunately, everything we choose to do, like just like when we play games ourselves, every choice has consequences. And so, no, I agree with you. It might hurt speedrunners, and I guess that would be something that game designers have to keep in mind. Would they have to create a non-adaptive version and an adaptive version? Would that be part of finding that the mock hacker community winds up creating an adaptation one into games? Um, and I guess also the trading cards between player was um, the question regarding that, like what would happen when player B gets player's A game? Will it be acting like it's player A instead of player B? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. That's actually that one I actually haven't thought of. That's a really interesting thought. Um, I guess for a disk based game, that wouldn't be an issue because your memory card would be clean. But for a cartridge game, yeah, it would store the memory locally. And I guess, I mean, eventually, hopefully, you would have, hope it adapts to player B from A after a while because it's observing new behavior. But I'm actually not sure. I guess I, a factor sounds like that would be the easiest way to handle that. But I guess that could also be a fun little thing. Like some professional player plays the game and then pawns it off on eBay to say, hey, play this tailor to me. Um, but in terms of the game experience for the player, that's an excellent question. I think it's especially important because we make games for the players to enjoy and also express something from the creators. So if it violates these constraints of the player experience and the creator's desire, that's, I think, another consequence we have to think about from the choice. So thank you. Those are good points. Uh, what sort of games are you looking at using as a test bed for this technology? Like, are there frameworks you can download and extend? or? Um, so that's an excellent question. Yeah, um, so that's an excellent question. So right now, one thing, um, when I was working with Alex Fukunaga, um, he works a lot on decision making, and we had actually built a Sokoban simulator for him to run easily with some planner. Sokoban might be one example, because there is actually a multiplayer variant where you can put two characters walking around. For those who don't know Sokoban, it's a game where essentially it's a puzzle where you have an agent who pushes blocks around to reach various goals with the blocks. And so you can easily see if you can recognize which blocks being taken to which goalposts then an adversary could try to prevent you from getting those blocks in there, and a friend could try to move other ones or help you get that block in there. And so I think that'll be one domain we could start in. Um, but we definitely want to move into other games in the future. Um, a fighting game might be possible. Uh, there is actually the Fighting Ice engine, which is very popular at the CIG conference for a competition. And was actually my undergrad who was doing some of the early work when he was motivated was trying to apply some of our work to it. But as we were talking about, runtime is a terrible thing. And so uh, unfortunately, it, was a great idea in theory, and he got the theory part published for his undergrad thesis work, but it wasn't playable yet to have to try in the fighting game, but we do have a framework kind of started for that one. I, I would suggest you also look at Minecraft, because there's some uh, industrial strength data right. made for it, and conveniently, you never have to leave Blocks World. Just, so just mm -hmm. like it is yeah, real that's, meter blocks. <laughs> that's extremely true, and yeah, and Minecraft is much more recent, I guess, than when we start all this work. We're absolutely right. We should look into that a lot more. I guess they've released things open source now as well for running in that sort of thing, right? Yeah, there's specifically yeah. modeling acronyms to integrate. Okay, awesome. I'd love to talk to you more about that. Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So how much does this depend on some kind of handoff or planning model? Uh, I feel like that's, uh, in, in my own work, a big obstacle has been, uh, you know, games are defined as these like transition functions that run at 60 frames per second or something. It's like a totally black box forward model. If, you know, maybe you have like six buttons you can press or something, those are your operators. Um, how, how do you propose that people uh, you know, turn, turn the games that they have or that they're thinking about into something that can work in this kind of framework? Right, um, that's a really good point. Um, so luckily I think some of the things like assets are really easy to represent already. I mean, we just heard from Matthew earlier that you can these uh, probabilistic graphical models to actually like look at layouts and level design and such. And for things like the character behavior, I think what that'll become is rather than having a bunch of AI engineers focusing on just creating these finite state machines, they might focus more on other representations, which can be done. I think uh, Jeff Orkin is really famous for his Fear Engine AI. And Fear was actually based off of an early planning framework called um, Strips or PDDL. And they essentially built this whole entire thing. And it did basic planning for um, large mass operatives based on that. So I feel like we, I guess, maybe be repurposing the AI engineer's goal. So instead of working on just creating this 
state machine or these behavior trees and the different like programs within it, it might be focusing more on using the black box algorithms for planning and recognition, but then actually engineering sort of these domain descriptions. So yes. I do think domain is going to be a big issue. So, so turning the AI programmers into modelers more, yeah. more so than they are. Yeah, I think so. Um, if, if there's not another question, I have a, an additional question. All right. All right. Um, so it's, there's a lot of different things an agent might decide to do based on knowledge of other agents' plans. What are, just because I'm not familiar with the area, what are some uh, maybe uh, extensions to the planning modeling languages or um, ways of even describing, say, for a robot, you know, how, how it should consider other agents or beliefs about other agents' behaviors in uh, to be a useful uh, in, in this kind of pair, pair framework? Hmm. That's an interesting question. So just to make sure I'm understanding correctly, like, I'm going to try rephrasing it just to make sure. Um, sure. Yeah, so I guess the question was like, what kind of, I guess, how we notate the things that are recognized to understand the player's intents and desires? Or, or like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm making a buddy AI for a game, and I, I want, uh, you know, I, I, I would like, if, the buddy AI recognizes that the player is trying to do some kind of task, mm -hmm. that it should even know that um, sort of like blocking enemies or something is like a desirable oh, okay. thing. Oh, like, OK. Right. So, so things like, yeah. oh, OK, prioritizing, yeah. So there actually are some ways that can be done in planning right now. Um, sometimes there's preference-based planning where, where you actually have different, I guess, some um, Things like for a robot, laying out like how it is versus how much like he's trying to do this. Maybe the button wants to prioritize. Even things where you can. Have so if we are going to engineer to the point that no certain figures matter, you can say the breaks down to the Already on the TA in case it goes. Unfortunately, uh, um, Summerville, the author of this paper, is going to not come today, uh, but we'll be showing a, a recorded presentation and then he'll be on the screen for question and answer uh, afterwards. Thank you, see Santa Cruz. And today I'm going to be discussing early work on a system uh, called LEDA. Uh, which is about learning to read games uh, about programming. Um, so I'm going to take sort of a roundabout way of discussing uh, later with sort of all the motivation up front. So the whole goal of this uh, project is uh, automatic game generation with me. Um, there's been a few people who have attempted this before, uh, Mike Cook with uh, some of the Angelinas, uh, my trainer Brian Blackbird, 
Michael McKay, Neil Bogos, and Ian Matic. Um, and the way that these systems have operated is that they, a user gives them some set of uh, desired meaning that they wish for the game to uh, uh, produce. Um, or in the case of Angelina, it make the come up, with on, come up with it on its own by looking at the news or what have you, uh, or a, uh, a theme. And then it tries to produce a game, uh, but these sort of operate in one direction. They, they take in this meaning, and then they do some actions uh, to try to produce a game that produces that. Uh, but they don't really understand the games that they're producing, and so the work that this has been doing has been trying to sort of uh, close the loop and create a full feedback loop on this so that the game, we can understand the game and understand the meaning from a game, and then so that we can take a meaning and generate a game, and then we can double check <coughs> and match the meaning that we wanted to have. Uh, and so that this uses a system uh, called the Procedural Greetings, uh, developed by Mike Trainer and others, uh, which is a process which takes in uh, as input sort of definitions of a game, uh, the entities that play, the resources found in the game, uh, and then combines that with the mechanics of the game. Uh, you know, if I press a button, you know, Mario moves upward. Uh, and then from that, um, you make inferences on the game based on that. So uh, the sort of first one is, are the dynamics. Uh, so, you know, I press a button, Mario moves up. Well, if Mario moves up, bumps his head on a question mark block that produces a mushroom, uh, etc. So all of these things are uh, working together and interacting in different ways. Uh, then from there we have the aesthetics. Uh, so you know how does this feel? Does it feel lively and like what is a player going to do? The player wants to jump up to hit the question mark block because it you know has a nice sound effect and it feels good and then it produces the thing that they like. Um, and you know it's not just uh, sort of these raw mechanical things moving, there's this theming, so uh, that can flow into the aesthetics. Does it, you know, have a good sound effect? Does it, uh, you know, look appealing to do something like that? And then all of these can combine to sort of derive, you know, come up with the meaning of a game. Uh, and these can, you know, sort of build on each other, and so meaning can build on meaning, uh, drawing up a higher inference chain. Uh, and of course, all of this is uh, has a sort of fuzzy blob of culture. You know, what feels good or seems like a, a pretty thing in one culture might be unappealing in another. Uh, so all of these things form the culture under which this, uh, readings take place. And so earlier work that uh, myself and Chris Martins and others did uh, looked to do this procedural readings uh, process procedurally. Uh, and to do this, we developed a domain-specific language for games uh, called Cygnus, which I'll go over in the next section. Then I'll discuss briefly our process of performing these proceduralist readings procedurally. And then finally, I'll discuss data and sort of why we are with we're at. So, Cygnus uh, is a language that is embedded within the answer prologue, so it's a bunch of predicates and buttons. Uh, so here we have uh, sort of the definitions that you might find in a game, uh, so the predicate of entity, uh, and then inside of that, so you can think of entity as sort of like a class, the paddle left is sort of a unique signifier that says there is something that in the course of this uh, game specification will be called left. Paddle left itself has no uh, semantics, all defined by how it, uh, all the other things that it, in the signal specification. And then you might have resources, and there are other ones too, but entities and resources being the two major things found. And then those come together uh, in the mechanics, uh, which are typically uh, groupings of preconditions, and then the results uh, if all those preconditions are met. Uh, so for instance, we might have the precondition that there is a control event, uh, and that control event being the player input of the up arrow being held, uh, and then that's the precondition for the outcome of moving up. Uh, and then the result of moving up, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, is that the left paddle moves north uh, at the speed of one unit per second. And so, you know, uh, this is sort of a brief snippet of what you might find in Pong. Um, and, you know, there'd be probably on the order of Pong, 38, 39, 40 uh, or so rules making up uh, and definitions making up Pong. Uh, and so that's uh, sort of a brief introduction to Cygnus. 
And now I'm going to discuss uh, how we have in the past performed these procedural screenings uh, procedurally, uh, and then finally discuss uh, where we're trying to go with this. So procedural screenings procedurally uh, are in the form of uh, inference rules on the sort of ground facts of the game. Uh, so say a sort of low-ish level uh, type uh, rule that we might want to make is what does the player control? Um, you know, so definitely defined in like Cygnus is there like player controls X, uh, but so we but we can infer it from based on uh, preconditions and outcomes. And so you know we might say that the player controls X if uh, we see there is some precondition based on a control event, and then that the result of that outcome that that precondition is based off moves some other entity. And there are other ways that a player might control the game or control an entity, uh, but this is one way that we might say that uh, there is player control of an entity. And so we, this is a, uh, you know, each of these capital letters is a, a variable, and then these can be sort of reified in a game in various different ways. So uh, in Pong, it's, you know, that the player controls the left paddle because we notice that when the player holds the up arrow, that that causes the paddle to move the board. Or say in Kaboom, uh, the player controls the bucket because when the player holds the left arrow, then the bucket moves west. Uh, and then finally, say there's some sort of single button asteroids or something, you know, the player controls the spaceship because the player clicks a mouse button and then that causes the spaceship to move forward. And so each of these would be different ways that you might find this in the sort of ground facts of the game. And so we can perform these inferences. And so this is a very simple one, uh, you know, it's sort of predicated only on the ground facts found in the game. Uh, but these can be chained together in, uh, you know, varying levels of complexity. So this is even like a sort of a mid-level complexity uh, inference chain about doing some sort of basic uh, uh, player modeling, uh, which is that the player will do uh, something by holding the cursor near something else, uh, because the only way that they move things is that they can control the mouse, and then the only way that uh, they do a good thing in the game is that by pushing uh, new ideas towards uh, uh, producers. And so anyway, uh, you know, you get this big long chain. So seven rules here for a pretty relatively simple reading of the, what the player will do um, together in larger and larger inferences chains. Uh, so this is uh, some stuff that we have <coughs> in the past. Uh, so now I'm going to finally discuss Lena. Uh, and where we're at, uh, and where we hope to go. Uh, so Lena takes in uh, these sort of Cygnus-specified games, and then some inferences that uh, a person might make about those games. So, you know, say we have Pong, and then say we notice that, uh, you know, the player controls paddle, the left paddle, uh, the computer controls the right paddle. Uh, and we notice that the points for the left-hand side are good, because those are what are good for the player. So Lena takes those in as input, and then the goal is to produce these rules. So trying to learn the, the reason why the player controls the left paddle is because uh, we notice in the game that it is the only thing for which uh, by, you know, there's some control event that fires and then that result, uh, that thing moving, or that the computer controls something if it moves and the player doesn't control it, or that something is good uh, you know, it is there's a positive resource check on it for the game being won if you know a, something is if those points uh, pass a high enough threshold. And so these are the types of rules that Leda produces uh, by looking at these uh, you know, sort of game definitions and higher order inferences. And so the way that Leda operates uh, is it first takes in all of those uh, ground facts of the game and observes. Uh, properties, and then produces a graph structure over that. Um, and so then it starts at uh, those higher order inferences and then traverses this graph. Uh, so, you know, we might start off here at, you know, the player controls the left paddle. And then we traverse this graph uh, in sort of increased order of complexity, uh, given that there's sort of this notion that 
a sort of minimally complex uh, rule that you know fully covers our set is going to be the best rule. Uh, so if we get full coverage of the facts that have and uh, it is the least complex, we hope that that would be the best rule uh, in general. So you know, here we have you know player controls paddle left, and then so say we traverse to the entity paddle left. This definition. Uh, so we would make a rule. We notice that there's this paddle left on both sides, and we uh, turn those into variables via an abstract indication process. So we get you know player controls x if entity x, uh, and so then we test that rule to see how, what our coverage is. Uh, and we see in this case, uh, it's not that great. We, we do get that the player controls X uh, and gets paddle left, but it also gets the right paddle and the ball. Uh, and so this, this rule gets thrown out and we continue on in the traversal. Uh, now we perform a, a breadth first traversal of this graph. Uh, and so then we come across you know, the player uh, controls something if it moves up. So then we get you know player controls something if uh, there is some result that results in that thing moving. Well, you know, again, that's incorrect because the right paddle also moves uh, in this way. Um, and so we wind up sort of coming across these rules and throwing them out as they aren't good. Uh, but eventually, you know, we do a common problem the player controls X if there's this precondition that, you know, the player does some input and then that results uh, in that thing moving. Um, so then we uh, perform a sort of Subsumption process where we test uh, ways of removing the functors found in this uh, definition, uh, which are the things of which you know don't have these sort of only base terminals inside of them. So in this case, uh, the moves, the input, and the control event then contains within it the player input. And so we test uh, trying to turn those themselves into variables again. The goal being to find the sort of minimal rule uh, that covers the set uh, that we're looking at. Uh, so in this case, uh, you know, we see how those would sort of be subsumed. Uh, the moves gets thrown out because we've now orphaned uh, the player controls X. Uh, so that's not considered because uh, it can't possibly be correct because we can no longer find an X based on what we have on the right hand side. Uh, we see that indeed in that case, it actually is the best. Uh, it does work out well. Um, it's, you know, it still is correct. Uh, you know, the player input is just one way of getting player input. There are other ways that there could be control events like clicking or what have you uh, in this case. Uh, and then finally, we see that if we try to subsume all of that, that just is looking to say, if there's some precondition that results in something moving, Again, that's incorrect because there are other ways to this could move, as we just saw in the last one, um, with the, the path, the right path moving. Uh, and so this is sort of where Leda is at currently. Uh, we can uh, uh, traverse this uh, graph uh, that sort of in, uh, automatically infers the types of things uh, of the of the uh, variables found, uh, and then search over that structure. Uh, and then find sort of the minimal uh, rule set. Uh, uh, so it's still very early work. Um, so it does this an exhaustive breadth first search. Uh, and so for the future, we'd like to make Lega more expressive. Uh, by counting things, uh, by checking if two variables are equal or not equal or what have you. Uh, and then finally, we'd like to make Lega fast, uh, better search pruning, better heuristics, uh, so that this exhaustive search is not so difficult. Thank you. All right, so we can give them a thank you video. So I'd like to do the opening. Yeah, I'm going to kill John, send him to join. Uh, uh, hmm. Uh, okay, this is me picking his audio. Oh, I was going to go plug him in. Oh, there okay. he is. Oh, great. Yeah, let's go plug in them over there.
Hey, Adam. Hello. Give us one second. Sure. Plug you in. Hey, you were all plugged in. Can you try speaking? Uh, yep. Hmm. Nope. Okay. Uh, let's try doing this. Like, let's. Hmm. Oh, I know. It. I know. What we can do. And we can. I... <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah.
how much how much time does it usually take to like encode the knowledge that you need to actually uh, for the system to be able to derive the rules? Uh, Adam, so the question was, how much knowledge does it need for it to derive the rules? And time. And time. Um, so, like, by this, like, you're sort of referring to, like, authoring in the game, like, lang the Cygnus language, uh, since that's sort of all it takes in as input. Um, I, I, that's, I, I'd say, a very subjective, uh, the time is very subjective on that front. Um, <laughs> I, as one of the two people who architected Cygnus, uh, am pretty fast at it. So, like, I can throw together, like, say, a simple arcade, you know, art game, like, say, Pong or Kaboom or uh, Pac-Man or something, uh, probably in the course of, like, I don't know, 10 minutes. Uh, but a, a if I were to give you the language specification and have you sit down, that would probably be a lot longer. So... Um, the question is, or the answer is, uh, it depends. <laughs> yeah, but uh, well, I wanted to have uh, a notion of uh, of how long would it take you, of course, <laughs> because you're the one who knows more. Uh, about then, then I'd say, then I'd say about ten minutes yeah. to, sure. to encode a game. But that's dependent on the complexity of that game. C certainly, certainly, yes, uh, and. Yeah, uh, like I said, so this has been a generator and a understanding system in the realm of, you know, single screen arcade style games that could have existed in like 1985 or something. So uh, it is of that type of complexity. Um, yeah. So, well, if no one has another question. Go for it. How, how do you envision people using these uh, now in, in uh, modern, modern uh, Games? Do you do you think that it would be useful for I don't know game for, for game developers and how but how how do you envision people using this system? Right. So originally the system was designed uh, as essentially uh, an authoring assistance tool for me uh, for a game generation system that. Uh, mm -hmm. Like we often, so this the game generation system was focused on generating games uh, that sort of had certain uh, like readings that a person could support. Like this is a game about X, Y, and Z. Um, and so instead of trying to author those rules, uh, you know, being given uh, play testing data from from a game, have people annotate and say, oh, I think this game has X, Y, and Z, or this uh, entity in a game has these properties, and then infer the rules from those. Um, so that was how it was uh, originally envisioned. Um, and I know that, uh, like, I've talked to, like, Mike Cook, who's also done a lot of game generation work, uh, and his most recent, or the, his vision for the, like, where his system is going is very much in that line, like sending things out to players and trying to understand how players are actually perceiving the generated games uh, so I could see it sitting uh, fitting into a system like that. So, so some for context, some examples of these kinds of readings are like there's a risk reward trade off between these two decisions that a player might make or um, this resource is involved in a positive feedback loop or um, like or this, is, this resource is tied to difficulty or something like that. Right. So so they could be like from the kind of medium game dynamics level all the way up to higher level stuff like um, you know something entity one is an adversary of entity two or entity one helps entity two or um, or or things like that. And I think that the goal once cultural knowledge gets a bigger role is for it to <laughs> incorporate things like beyond just you know E one. Arms E2, uh, like E1 is scary or something like that. Is that fair to say? Adam? All right. Yes. All right, any other questions? I'll stare my robotic eyes at you. All right, cool. Let's thank our, uh, our speaker. Thanks, Adam. Thank you. Bye. Bye.
All right, so now we are on coffee break. Yes, it's, I think, five minutes until the coffee is officially... <laughs> officially <laughs> present. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, thank you. I'm... Uh,
Oh, USB they, they changed. Oh, USB C. Yeah. These things are now uh, eight plugs. Well, look how many plugs they have on them. <laughs> <laughs> that probably runs Linux. Or at least I'm embedded ARM thing. Starting with the fit that like device itself has a brain buffer in it. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, old, older it versions of that did. Uh, like the um, the second generation of the iPad video foot adapter thing had a little video card on it. So the, now there's two up here. Is one of them? One of them might be mine. One of them might be some of them. Neither are they. Oh, cool. What the heck? Labels are apples. It helps if you put your whole email address, which I didn't. One of those is probably mine. <laughs> Okay. Oh, we found the, um, in case people want to know, the Wi Fi password for the Hilton Dunes SSID. Yes. Uh, it is our, I took a photo. That's right. Uh, the, the D is capitalized, I believe. Oh, it says AT, sorry. Uh, capital D Disney. Disney. <laughs> All capitals, AI, triple AI. Just AT. That's what it said on the <laughs> I like this tutorial we're broadcasting. Great, you are logged in. Congratulations. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, I that's all it needs. <laughs> Where we are. Let's see what happens. No, I mean, don't worry about it. I think it's on right now, and that's fine because it'll help a little bit, but yeah. this is a small enough room. It's the stream just, is just picked up by the org. Yeah, we don't have any audio input, unfortunately. Okay. All my videos are just pictures. Whenever you're ready, I think okay, we're good to go. Well, welcome back to the second session. Sure, you can uh, <laughs> I remember what the, the theme of our five things in this state extraction, or at least things that yes. are related to state. Uh, it seems to also be a coming of as one view of the state. Uh, my name is Adam Smith, I'm the professor at UC Santa Cruz. The new uh, my research engineer is at UCAM. Um, let's start. Uh, before I go into the, the meat of the talk, I want to make contact with this uh, existing idea of word embeddings. How many of you have heard of words of that? A bunch. Okay. Uh, well, so if you want your natural language processing system to be able to handle a very large vocabulary, uh, so that uh, maybe you want to be able to recognize the meaning of Word, uh, you'll have to see consume a giant contact with all of those you have on one. And those, uh, hope you can have a great this matrix equals one that maps us into a business application with properties. Um, so it knows how to uh, generalize the making English word. Sense of where we're going. I'm going to give a motivation moment. Why we want to go word vector type. Um, uh, introduce some terminology from the vector model. Talking about the Super Nintendo platform. Some of you grew up with it. Some of you didn't. Um, the source of our play data sets, including games from playing experiment. There's some a bunch of different uh, models or different uh, in models that we're going to compare, and then putting these together in a in an example uh, visual search engine. So I have projects, a few of them. Maybe you are an algorithm designer coming to the AAA AI conference saying you have a variation on uh, Duke Nukem uh, UK arcade games like this Atari submarine game. I don't remember the name of it in particular. 
and you want to be able to say my algorithm plays by just and then taking action to learn from the outcome. Um, instead of uh, neural network, I always go from the pixels and the nice uh, computation that's everything you need about it. You don't want to have to engineer that yourself, but you would like to be able to sit down, uh, perhaps to the game too much. Um, so you have these dense, meaningful semantic vectors. Maybe you could say my model is going to play from the embedding instead of playing from pixels. Uh, on the other side, and much less represented at AAAI, maybe you're a scholar, uh, a person in the digital humanities, and you want to make uh, an argument about how the mechanics of boss fights work in different platform games. Um, and in order to do this, you would like to be able to find game states and the screenshots associated with them for the boss fights in many different games. So uh, maybe your expertise is as a scholar and not as a game player, you don't quite have the skill to reach all those boss battles yourself. You would like to somehow be able to just search for them and find them directly, possibly by saying, I have a picture of one, we generalize this, and we transfer that across games. Um, so hopefully uh, for that audience, we can be able to build a search engine for that. How many of you have done any information retrieval stuff? Well, it's, it's not much. Um, there, there's some papers about that at, at the conference. Uh, so this is a, a typical and actually a, a, a old idea in information retrieval uh, to represent documents. Whenever I say, whenever IR people say documents, for games we can imagine these are the, the moments or the states in the game. We're going to represent those as vectors or points in some high dimensional space. And I'm going to emphasize moderately high dimensional. We don't want it to be 100,000 dimensional, very, very sparse with no structure. We would like it to be maybe moderately high dimensional, 100 dimensions or something like this. Uh, that might be typical for a, a nearest neighbor system. Uh, and we're not going to say that the similarity between things is their Euclidean distance, but we're going to use their cosine distance or cosine similarity, um, which for uh, the traditional case of a we we're coming up later. Uh, and then, so how do we define a moment? There are many notions of moment you can use, like the feeling of being in a ball. Well, for us, we're going to say, a moment is represented by everything you need to reproduce the state of the game and the platform it's executing on uh, in that time from one animation frame to the next, like a very uh, precise uh, information sense uh, of moment. Um, so you can think of the native representation of this is just a big byte array, a snapshot of your machine. And in this huge byte array, someone might be able to tell you the layout of it and say, oh, at byte 536 is the current score, actually maybe the, the low order byte of the score if it's, a, if it's a bigger number. Maybe it tells you the x, y position of your character. Maybe it says what level you're on. Uh, maybe it says uh, which character you've added to your party. Um, in addition, we, there are things, lots of useful state like that. There are lots of other kinds of memory in many game platforms. Video memory, uh, data. Sometimes um, video memory is also used as frank collision flag. So there's actually a little bit of mechanics of the game implemented in the, the video hardware, and lots of other subsystem state, audio buffers, um, the latency state for buttons, and so on. There's a whole lot of information in here. Some of the things that are most interesting to us are things like, what is the current score? Where is my character on the screen? But we don't know where that is in these giant byte arrays in general. Um, so in order to, following off the ideas of these word tech models, we would like to take our giant sparse unstructured vectors and crunch them down to their sort of semantic summaries. And just as in the case of word vectors, we're going to set up a property task uh, where we have lots and lots of data. In word to vec, they would say, well, given a word, pick the word that comes after it and before it. We have lots of data that, for that because we have lots of words in their context. Um, uh, so the things I plug in here might be like, the pixels that you get from a screenshot of the game. This is some 100,000 dimensional vector. And maybe the context, we can say, from the screenshot, try to predict where the character is. From the screenshot, try to predict the score of the game. Maybe from the screenshot, try to predict the screenshot again, having gone through a bottleneck here. Many different models we could set up here, and each of those leads to a different representation in this, in this bottleneck. So we could either save these states, or more likely, we would want to save our encoder model that we can put this into future projects. 
little bit of background on the Nintendo unit system platform, uh, simplifying a lot of the interesting and juicy details. Uh, they platform released in, in 1991, at least in the North American market. There are about 700 games. You can get all these online and download them and say, test your game, test your algorithms on all of the official games. Um, games are usually distributed in these plastic cartridges. We can think of these as being mostly just a chunk of read-only memory. But technically, the more recent ones had processor own and RAM and other things in them. But you can think of it as just being data that you plug in. And as a result, most of the state of the game is stored in the, the platform itself, particularly in a section of RAM called the work RAM or WRAM. Um, and it happens to have 28 kilobytes of it, which is much more than uh, sorry, that people have been looking at for in automated game playing for a while, but it's not as bad as a mom, you know, so it's somewhere in between those. And the display is slightly more detailed than the Atari display, more colors and so on. Uh, so, uh, I want to say we're not going to actually deal with the physical wires and plastic versions of here. We're going to download um, an, uh, an emulator for the Super Nintendo platform, particularly one that has a Lua scripting API that we can plug into Python and we can control it from our Jupyter notebooks and so on. So, that's how we integrate with it without talking to Nintendo and stuff. <laughs> uh, so, from this, I can pull out some things. We can say, well, the state of the work RAM, we could say, 120 kilobytes times 1024 is 101,000 thing. That's sort of where we think most of the important state of the game is. Um, but that includes the observable stuff, like the number here, the state of the characters that are off screen, things you cannot at all deduce from the current pixels. Meanwhile, there's lots of stuff in the pixels that are not actually the work. They work for stuff in video memory, maybe sprites and color palettes and stuff that we're not worried about. You can think of this as emphasizing the observable things, emphasizing the other things. So we're going to use those as a source for our different vector representations. Um, I already mentioned this runs. Uh, so that all the experiments I'm going to talk about for the rest of the talk deal with these two particular data sets. Uh, you might call these corpora in a retrieval sense of there are a bunch of documents in a collection of documents is called a corpus. We happen to have two corpora. One of them is a one-hour expert gameplay speedrun that was downloaded from the Toolsys Speedruns community website. They have lots of these for different games. Um, some of them purposely beat the game in a port. This one happens to be called a 100% speedrun that says, we'll beat the game really quick, but we're not going to skip past anything. But it won't. Um, the mistakes, they backtrack through any areas that don't have to. So, because it's a nonlinear platformer, the character will turn a room through there and come back to the same location, but never as a result of mistakes. Our other data set comes from Super Mario World. Um, let's say this is just the expert gameplay. It's uh, Zeping playing the game for about a similar <laughs> length, covering about a third of the game. Uh, and given that it's a fairly linear platformer game uh, of repeating going back to similar states as a result of making mistakes, dying, starting the level over, or starting and abandoning, and so on. Uh, we just want more than one game, more than one style of play to say that we're not just overthinking the test. And in the future, we're, we have an army of graduate students trying to give us 15 minute gameplay for every single experience kind of games. Then we can talk about the platform as a whole. But we don't have that data. That's um, we could be recording these things 60 frames per second. Those are all technically distinct little moments. That's just way too many data. The platform. Uh, so we were happy to save it only 10 frames per second. So you can think from one hour gameplay about 3600 moments. Uh, those are experiments. So, um, in order to say whether different presentations are useful or not. We're not going to build a deep learning agent on top of it. We'll come up with a, a proxy. Um, this is one we're going to take from information. We're going to say uh, a query moment out of one of those gameplay videos. Uh, when I say videos, I'm using um, And then we're going to ask our system 
get all of the other moment vectors using the normal cosine system. Uh, sort them by similarity, similarity to three. And a good vector representation will put moments near the top of the list and unrelated moments near the bottom. And we're going to use called mean accuracy, um, which I won't get into details, which are to go back to later. Essentially, on our expert data of people that one is not what is the right answer here so we're a proxy uh, we're going to say for a randomly selected query point in the original uh, gameplay we're going to say that uh, there's sort of three different scales of Time based relevance. Say it's relevant if it happened within two sets. So, uh, a model that is specific, like very focused on precisely where you are in the very good task, but from small value uh, to say, is it capturing perhaps level progression progress? For a level of Scroll on to the beginning of the next level. So I have to say, in those who are close to people, we'll have to work in each of these different things. Um, this is also over specializing on time and space based um, because we have two rooms. We found two bytes in the room your, your character is in, in your metro. And requires Mario which level you're on. So when you die and re when you're in that same level, even if it happened like 15 minutes later. So these are no ones. Um, these are uh, not really specific to one of them. But these are like truly notions of relevance. Um, Player characters that all in other games. Um, there's a couple of different moments back there. Uh, three minutes. This is if you take each bite in the app of the emulator to store the same game, it gives you all bytes. Right. It definitely has. It's not uh, structured. So if we evaluate the function as a representative, um, we get a, a variety of scores. Um, too much to say about this here. If you're formatively, it's very hard to get even perhaps one. Uh, Vector that is multiplied with the cosine system. Yeah, yeah. Without, you know, exactly. Okay. Um, which, which is like a very easy thing to implement. Um, but we're going to improve on this. Um, we can say, well, we think that the, this vector includes lots of stuff that probably isn't important, like the state with audio buffers, the low level graphics stuff. Maybe we want to focus on the important state of the game. So we said, how about we just look at 120 kilobytes of main as the, the main memory? Uh, and this score was around 60% uh, saying that um, informally, you could this is if interacting with a search engine, you put in your query and you looked at the top two blocks, about six out of 10 of them would likely be relevant according to one of these different factors. Um, and I don't care to explain the different colors, say that. For different tasks. So the important thing is sort of clustering. Um, so here is that these vectors are not compact at all. If we're trying to make this easier than reason about the raw pixels of the game, uh, 120 kilobytes is about the same number of freedom as our pixels. So in compacts, but we have the retrieval ability. Um, so we said, well, we 
looked at the memory layout for a lot of popular games, and we noticed that a lot of interesting memory state is actually stored in the first, first four kilobytes of memory. It happens to be a read memory access to the rest, so they, they tend to put important stuff like the player health and X, Y positions and so on. Um, and in fact, we focus on that area, it gets even better at this at this retrieval task. Um, this is a super specific thing, but it starts to say, starting to help us understand where the important parts of that state vector are. Um, but again, it's a compact, this is 4,000 bits. We would like it to be smaller, like low hundreds. Um, so one of the simplest methods we could use to take a professional between three and six will return Grades a little bit like the same. 200 is enough to do all of this. Informally, I would need a ton of projections, almost the same results as DCA 256. Um, so it doesn't take many dimensions to store the important stuff. It doesn't actually take deep reading on this, it can just be a linear transformation. Uh, the problem here is that these are still on memory. We would, we would like to have things work with screenshot pixels. Uh, and if you go try to use the um, 168,000 bytes of pixel data, um, this is not very good for retrieval purposes. It's getting overly confused by saying, oh, this, this screenshot is full of big fields of green, and this one is also full of big fields of green, but these are on way different ends of the game, just because the levels had similar dominant and so on. Uh, and this is variable across the tree models. So it doesn't perform as well, and it's not compact. Uh, well, what if we just force it to be compact by making it use PCA? PCA happily similar with the and vector, so there's actually some improvement in retrievability. Um, but you want does that look like this from pixels? Um, yeah, inspired by uh, Words of Beck of saying, we'll try to create, we'll try to memorize parts of the picture memory. And if you set up to with a bottleneck layer of 256 dimensions, it doesn't help. <laughs> it's a nice compact vector, lost much information. And uh, it's in this about and across the games and across the modes, thing that is performing more of these, despite the fact that it's looking only at uh, the pixels in a single screenshot. We're not doing some trick like the lap four screenshots or something. So there's it's radically up in the state you're in looking at the screenshot, but uh, the convolutional neural network. Think of this as given the uh, 4,000 parallel proxy tasks to train on, and it's not good at any of those tasks, but it's good at factoring in the common features you need to explain in order to get those tasks. Realistically, that all these. Uh, upper base uh, is pretty good. Uh, uh, not actually being trained on this retrieval task. Like, there are differences about training, vector embedding, specific retrieval tasks. Um, but we didn't have this notion of relevance at the network. Uh, also, I had maybe two months of deep learning experience. I'll try their end at this. They could come up with than the one we did. Um, this was useful for retrieval and making a video game search engine. So you can see here a demo video of a visual search engine. Take a screenshot off your desktop, drop it onto our site. It applies the pre trained embedding model while running it construct clearly. And it says, okay, from the corpus that we record. I think these are sometimes there are other ones that are not relevant. You tell positive, negative, or like that. That matches the sense of relevance I'm working with, or that one doesn't. 
uh, that comes up with that and we'll run through a search again. Uh, you can sort of negotiate with the sense of relevance when it shows also. Um, so that's a, a function system network job. Also, are you GPU accelerator for the web? This part of it was actually was really easy. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're using Keras, and Keras has an exporter to load into Keras.js. Um, well, I can talk more about the implementation details uh, after. Uh, but th this is an example of like, um, we're, we think these uh, are capturing really as evaluated by the the test tab, the proxy, proxy tab being retrieval, but at the beginning of the they useful application that we're going to expand even more and make it available for game scholars. Um, another thing we're going to be doing is, this is even talking about the past uh, AAA conference, it's full screen, <laughs> no, full screen buttons underneath. Uh, so you can sort of see some sparkly line thing over here. This is a map of the first uh, level of, of Super Metroid, and we have a system record where you can map out the reachable areas of the game. Uh, this one is just considering the XY plane of Samus. Uh, soon we will switch to the moment representation as a more semantic representation, overly focused on just pixel coordinates. Because in this game, it's not just about uh, getting from one side to the other. Sometimes it's going to take an hour. Now you're in a very different state, now it's time to go to the right uh, or to the left or backtrack something. So there's more to state than just your expectation. These vectors are going to help. Um, also in the future, because we have this sort of time-based version of worlds, we can actually go out of our way to directly train our embedding to be good at people by right? uh, adding a penalty term in the optimization used in learning that when you get the vector for where you are now, somewhere in the place, and two vectors, maybe one second from now and one five minutes from now, the embedding of a seconds from now one should be closer than the five minutes away from now one. Um, this is what goes under the heading of manifold learning or using the triplet loss. And we've just been discovering these things in literature. They seem like good ideas, but we hadn't thought of that out of doing what, what was in the, the workshop paper. Um, so there is this thing that once you just for Nintendo, where there's like hopefully small amounts of memory and low resolution, and, and we might respond like if these things are you know, larger than the Atari game that we're talking about in the news. Um, but if you take a game that came out recently, like Horizon Zero Dawn for the PS4 Pro, these are fancy 4K HD images. Um, it's not just, uh, we don't know which part of memory has the important game state. We just know that this uh, tends to use almost block on memory, about eight gigabytes of it. Um, what needs to change about our model to work in this case? It could just be uh, network architecture tricks, like we use bytes directly. We use a sequence model that tries to predict a sequence of bytes, uh, and then or we ask it ten bytes and be good at those. Um, changes would be needed. What's needed to scale to more games? Is um, network is other things. Um, reminds me of I meant to mention earlier is that we're not here using uh, Purple Game as a test bed for some other tests. We are interested in helping people play uh, commercial games that, that had a cultural impact that were played by millions of players. So we're not willing to take the game and simplify it in order to better show off our algorithm. We need to make whatever technical mess is needed in order to make progress on these games if, if they're going to help scholars they search for moments in Zero Dawn. Um, and we will. But they, you cannot get downloads from the Super games. Uh, so if you take anything away from this, it's that moment vectors are like word vectors for video game dates in the same way that if you were doing a neural NLP project these days, you might start by downloading a word embedding model and say, I'll just let it vocabulary. I don't need to get data. I don't need to train on every possible word of the English language. I'll just work with this rich embedding. Consider doing the same thing. 
if you want to work from either raw memory or raw images. static screenshot, but a uh, small number of frames uh, in order to be able to use uh, of, of, of the frames that are predicted. You get better results that way, and in turn, that's what the one thing gets better of. I totally agree that this is similar to saying uh, for word embeddings, embedding a single word by itself, you can get more information if you know the context. It's still useful to have the embedding of a single word itself so that it's a compact representation that you then use a recurrent context. So, more structure, I think, more complex for how but we limited it so that, that that encoder model is reusable in the most future tasks. Um, something uh, I could think of doing is taking, say, like the last four frames, applying the same encoder model to them. And then a simpler model on top that's, that summarizes, okay, if you see these embedded vectors of these four frames, guess the direction of things, because the direction was ambiguous from them. Um, and maybe we could have uh, another part of the task on top of it that says, not only should it um, be good at, given a screenshot, predicting the memory now, but given the last few screenshots, predict the memory you know, one second from now, and at the same time, predict a, a distribution over which buttons I should be pressing so they will go at the same time. We have a lot of data for that. Uh, it just comes down to more supervised learning things. Um, I think we will explore those in the future. But, but there was an, by analogy to word vectors, we definitely want to get the single word, a single moment in our isolation first. Um, just following on the I think it would be. And uh, like there's times when just looking at the last four is not enough to know what's going on. For example, in Super Metroid, many of the power ups you pick up, uh, like if it happened jump, if you haven't seen yourself jump in the last minute, you may have forgotten that you've got that power up. Or you could always go to your options menu and like look at look at these settings so that some of these things you actually in order to know what to do next, you have to have memory of something that was that hadn't been observable for the last say something like that. So it needs to be extremely long range uh, dependence and uh, I would love to train models that, that do that. <laughs> uh, but a lot of this comes down to um, we also need uh, data that, that shows representative gameplay. And even though we were really excited about being able to use speed run data, it's actually not a very good representation of how average typical human beings play the game. They're glitching through walls, skipping all these things. Um, so if we had something that was automatically having the properties of your game, but had the confidence of a speed runner and skip enough, say, broken, but a game like that got released in some of those versions I got released because that's the goal of the play. But yet those are discoverable. Uh, to get ideas from, from other people here about how to do this extreme long-term, long-range dependence thing to remember something that happened, say, 15 minutes ago, time to see track for second is a huge distance away in terms of, like, how the answer is. Thank you so much to Wizards for letting me borrow the VGA adapter because uh, I didn't bring one.
to uh, observers will have determined I am not Daniel, not Daniel, not David. I'm Melody Fulda, I'm here from Brigham Young University uh, to talk about some of our work. Uh, David's going to try and stop by. He's giving an invited talk in one of the other two workshops right now. But so we're working with uh, screenshots taken from the Skyrim game from Bethesda. It's an open world action role playing game. One of our graduate students sacrificed personal time in order to collect screenshots. That's you know, a great personal sacrifice for the lab. Uh, we have about 65. It's not a huge set, but we're playing around with it to see what can we do if we have some of these more complicated images. One of the things that we notice right away is that each image evokes a certain set of interactions that feel appropriate. As a human looking at these images, the windmill invites the player to explore, to look more closely at things, maybe to journey to places that are visible. Um, the forge scenario invites the player to experiment, to manipulate these objects, pick things up, turn them around, use them, maybe forge something. And then you have combat situations where a completely different set of triggers fire. And each moment of the game not only enables possibilities, but to a certain extent constricts them. We call these interaction modes. We define it in our work as the set of player actions that would be reasonable to execute in a given situation. So for example, if you're facing down this guy, it wouldn't make much sense to go explore around the rocks, look behind the tree, check your inventory, or uh, you know, maybe try to buy his hatchet there. Some things just aren't gonna function real well. Same thing here. In this situation, again, you're not part of the rock. You're probably not gonna attack the cooking pot. There's a different set of behaviors. It's one pixel. What kind of interaction is supported by the situation? It kind of happens in Mario Kart. Sometimes you need to accelerate. Sometimes the player, even Pac Man, sometimes you're shaking the goat, sometimes you're fleeing. And these behaviors become important. Um, also in studying games, even mapping the game. On the traditional screen interaction. So in our work, we define four basic interactions in a threat situation where we need to flee, an exploration situation, the primary goal is to get information, bartering situations, and the third one I think is a really good name for it. We called it puzzle. Uh, what we mean by that is a situation where the user can manipulate items, combine items, do find fine motor control, basically. Yeah, we're picking things up, we're moving stuff around, we're manipulating the objects. So our algorithm wants to extract these, this information from pixels. And here's the basic data flow. We start with pixels, we run it through a caption generator in order to get text. Why text? Because it works in context space. I'm gonna explain that in just a minute. We then take this text and run it through a classifier based on the sitzout encoding that I'll explain in a minute in order to determine the interaction mode. So text has a couple of key advantages for our purposes. First, it avoids constraints. Nobody has a network that's trained to go from pixels all the way to your interaction mode. We could make one, but we're lazy. We want to use things other people have trained and do awesome stuff with it. So instead of retraining, we use a pre-trained classifier to go to text, and then we use a pre-trained pre text-based model to do a simple linear classification and get our interaction mode. Why text again? Well, it gives us what we call a gestalt representation, meaning that the individual items in a scene are sometimes less important than the way they interact together. A man holding a hammer is not a threatening situation. A man who's frustrated and angry isn't necessarily threatening either, but an angry man holding a hammer is something you would have to be cautious about. And it's these interactions of different elements that interest us. And as we'll talk about in a second, the sits out encoding tend to embody these kinds of semantic meanings and lets us manipulate them numerically. Third, simple common sense reasoning. Again, leveraging the text. I'm a big, we do, we do cognitive reasoning and a lot of natural language understanding. So I'm very, very big on the text. But one of the things that we can do in these text spaces is to understand the meaning of, of situations. So for example, a tunnel can be traversed. And that's something that you can extract, extract from the text. Uh, some of our previous work focused on that. From that, you can infer that this is maybe an exploration scenario. 
that can be harvested, people can be spoken, that would imply that perhaps there's two different interaction modes present here, puzzle and explore. So how does this work? We've already had a basic invitation to words of X. We're actually taking a step farther. We're using a sequence, a sequence model called skip sets that does the same thing at the sentence level. But for clarity, let's talk about the basic training algorithm at the word level and then just tweak it one step up. So uh, you take Wikipedia, you run it through a neural network, again, trying to predict context. And at the end of that, you extract the weights and they give you a vector representation for each word. And there's some really fun structures. For example, if you take the vector for king, which is you know, 100 to 300 dimensions, depending on who trained it and how, subtract the vector for man and add in the vector for woman, by common sense, natural logic, what would you expect to come out of that if you were a person? Queen, queen yeah. You almost get there. Actually, queen is not the nearest word to where you end up. The nearest word is king. That's a fundamental problem. But the second nearest word is queen. Um, and if you exclude your source words of your analogy when you're doing these computations, the closest remaining word is usually the word one, or at least often enough to be very interesting. So what we have here is a case where the vector is encoding the semantic meaning of the word. You can subtract away masculinity, add in femininity, and you get to a different word that contains a different semantic meaning. This is super fascinating to us. So the logical jump is to say, well, let's do this in sentences. Um, and the skip thought architecture takes this same concept. It says now we're training each sentence based on the sentence you saw before and the sentence you saw afterwards, just like the game moments. And the idea is that we now encode a semantic meaning of the sentence. Oh, second thing, it's not just, it's not just a gender issue, guys. You can do it with cities and capitals. You can do it with a number of things, uh, affordances, in fact. You can, uh, you can do some vector manipulation and find out and a stick can be hit and a tree can be climbed, which um, in some of our work with uh, text-based adventure games is really cool. We played with that a lot. Okay, so caption generation. Here we are, we have pixels. We're gonna move, move some captions. We use three different caption generators. We, uh, we were looking primarily for uh, something with good API that, uh, that we could use with a reliable, reasonable amount of reliability. We settled on caption bot, clarify, and uh, yeah, this is my dog. She's uh, 12 years old, she was 11 when she did these captions for us, and uh, some of her captions are really fun. The caption bot um, almost gets it done. It's really fun to play around with caption bot. Um, it can recognize a lot of things, screws up a couple of things. And so the question is, can we make use of this, right? Is the captioning software good enough that we can extract interesting information even though we know it's messing up the captions? Clarify takes a different approach. Um, instead, of, instead of a designed caption, you get a list of words that it was able to positively identify within the key. And we turn that into a caption by concatenating all the words into a, a non-sentence and running that through our algorithm. Um, and our human captioner has never played Skyrim. I had no specialized knowledge of the algorithm and was simply asked to give a one sentence description of each picture. And interestingly, there was a lot of subconscious inference that happened in that. So uh, from a linguistic standpoint, she would describe things like, it's a woman in front of her house. So she assigned ownership of the house to the woman. Although of course there's nothing in the scene that would imply that. So now we have, instead of missing data or incorrect data, we have extra inferred data in the captions, which may or may not be useful. It's, a, it's an interesting thing to consider. So now we have text, and we're going to take that text and copy it. And here come the skip thought vectors. Sequence to sequence learning, you take an input sentence, you run it through an LSTM, and you give it the learning task of predicting the sentence before and the sentence afterward. The embeddings that you learn this way give us a couple of advantages. So we have representations based on context. They're big. They're 4,800 dimensions, which kind of a problem, but it generalizes to previously unseen data. You can take a sentence that the system has never ever seen before and it will still have some idea of what it thinks that sentence means. And what we do in this space is simple linear classification. So you have one category, you have another category, you have examples. We have the user give about 10 examples of each kind of situation. And now we have a new image coming in as pixels, turn into text. 
them, we're going to say it's that category, just like that. So like we have no learning happening here at this level. We have no fancy anything. We've got oh, like two lines of math based on instructions like this. Ten examples for each category. That's all we got. And the question and the concept that we wanted to explore here is, is that enough? Can you get any kind of reasonable performance with some? It's really that simplistic. So we explored a couple of different ways of representing. We did explore skip thought vectors. We also explored bad words, where a sentence was represented skip thought, but I think it's really a word to vet of the course of here. Don't take that back. We used glove for that. But I think that the average of the glove vectors. Uh, and we looked at what different classification methods, nearest centroid, nearest exemplar. So I mean, by centroid, are you averaging all of the words? A cluster and then taking the distance to the average when you classify, or are you looking for the nearest member of the cluster to the point that you're at? Oh, yeah, some interesting results. So, on strict classification accuracy, that means for each given category, threat, explorer, barter, puzzle, how often do you get it right? Not stellar, as you can see. Definitely, definitely not uh, anywhere near state of the art performance if you were training with like a, a customized network just for this. If you can to a baseline that's just trying to do that uh, language processing without any kind of embedding, there's a significant improvement there. So there's definitely signal. It's a little bit of stuff we still need to look at. And that's a strict classification accuracy. Is this a threat? Yes or no? Is this a bartering situation? If you try to get in this match, meaning if you had a human classify this image and say, hey, this is a threat. This is a barter and a puzzle situation, and you try to match every single thing exactly right. Oh, yeah, and if you use the human captions, you get 75 accuracy. Sorry. Um, that's on its own thing because our human captioner didn't have time to caption every single one of the data sets. So there's a, there's a slight statistical discrepancy there. If you're looking at exact matches, what you see now is that it's much more difficult. But here, we really have a problem. We can't exactly match. The performance we can we can get any significant story we can get it pretty close but we can't get all the categories right all the time. Um, again, if you have human captions, classify that as frisbees. You do a little bit of both here. Is that most of the problem is in the way we're parsing, this, which we actually find encouraging because what it means is you can take the noisy caption. You can take a caption that's not giving you all the data in all the right ways, and you can manipulate the vector properly. You can do this. So, although it's not super great numbers, we think this is a really encouraging direction. So, we also found that the nearest classifier works a lot better than the nearest center. Uh, and if you're doing, and if you're doing partial matches, meaning you don't have to get every classification exactly right, you just to get one of the classifications that a human would agree is valid. So you have to come up with a valid classification, but you don't have to, to judge the way a human would, which is fair because humans disagree about which interaction modes are evoked. Now we're getting up really interesting. You know, average on this task would be, uh, random on this task would be about 25%, so we're doubling that if we have human captions. So there's, again, there's signal here. There's something valuable that we think really is so let's take a look at where it flies. Exploration situations actually it almost never fails. Pretty much classifies those ones right all the time. The theory of that is because landscape descriptions show up a lot and are very easy caption by the mountains and the clouds and everything else really well. Combat situations almost always fail. So we did, this is one of the better ones. This one worked out really well. But uh, look at the caption by caption. Yeah, we get that problem a lot. Apparently, CaptionBot hasn't seen a lot of swords or guns or um, you know anything that you'd really want a game exploration situation. So one of the things that we notice is, hey, it would be really great if somebody had a caption generator trained on video games. You know, and some caption generators we tried online actually all they would say when we put in our data images, they're like, I think it's a video game. This looks like video game input. <laughs> but tell us what's in there. Uh, puzzles. This one's fascinating. Caption bot called it a clock. And then our algorithm didn't think a clock was uh, 
something you could interact with, which kind of makes sense because in many cases a clock sits on the wall. So this is a situation where um, senses and meanings of word sentences, what kind of clock are we talking about? You know, one with little gears that you push and turn or one that sits on the wall and you look at it. Uh, this one, this is one of my favorite examples of the human text here. The uh, captioner's uh, commentary on the shopkeeper's physique actually screwed the algorithm because it, uh, it got a little distracted on other elements and, uh, and lost track of the fact that we had some, some bartering elements. So here, too, we have a situation where the vectors, the actual embeddings that we're using, are focusing on the wrong stuff. Or they're getting distracted. They tend to be tailed up. So it skips out vectors. Whatever is at the end of the sentence tends to be more significant than, uh, than the beginning of the sentence. And this, in my opinion, is a real limitation of the system because it means a subtle variation, a couple of extra words at the end, can screw your entire classification. We don't like that. So what's next? Where do we want to go? Well, we think this is cool. We definitely want to continue this <coughs> because we think there's something to be discovered here. Uh, I remember one on our list. Uh, we're working to train better sentence level embeddings. Skip thoughts are awesome, but as we've explored them in the lab, we found that they don't maintain the same analogical structures and relationships that you get at the word level. Word to that, you can add and subtract words and perform ana analogical reasoning tasks, and you get a lot, a lot of correct answers. And so, our initial instinct, and everyone's initial instinct, is oh, yeah, we can just skip that the same way. We'll just do the same thing at the sentence level. The embeddings aren't there yet. Um, if, you, if you plot skip thoughts out, um, you know, ba based on uh, relevant distance, it keys in on punctuation before anything else. So all of the sentences that end in a period are in one cluster, and all of the ones that end in an exclamation point are somewhere else. Uh, you get a couple of uh, word syntactic structure tends to dominate uh, semantic meaning. A long, complicated sentence appears in documents next to other long, complicated sentences. And you know, see, dig, see dog run is over here next to all the short ones. We'd like an embedding that keys in on what's really happening instead and, and takes care of that. So that's a big area of research for us. More sophisticated classifiers obviously could improve results here, right? We're doing two lines of math. If you add a little network layer in there in order to leverage specific elements of the embedding for your specific task, uh, we would expect to see better accuracy, but we haven't tried it yet, so we're worth looking at. And finally, um, we really think someone should train vision systems on the things. <laughs> We think that there's a lot of really valuable information that simply isn't accessible because CaptionBot and Clarify all care about, you know, selfies and web shots. So that's where we want to go with this. Oh, captions generated correctly from the game state. I forgot that one. We're going from pixels. But if you have direct access to the game engine, because you're doing game design, for example, you can give yourself a completely accurate caption. You can say, in this scene, there's a windmill and a troll and a rock in the treasure chest. Once you're armed with that, now you can apply the rest of the algorithm. We think that would be really interesting to explore. So thank you for your time. The application? So we're interested in uh, the cognitive research elements of it. We're interested in Gestalt representations of the image, what, uh, what can you see? So for, for us in our lab, Bethesda and Skyrim are really just an, an evaluation platform for reasoning tasks, common reasoning, common sense knowledge. Uh, in terms of video game designers and video game players, we think that this might be useful to them uh, in the sense of automated agents. You know, determining what type of situation you're in and how to behave. In terms of game design, as a game design tool, I could imagine that it might be interesting to, to see a breakdown of your interaction modes and what kinds of interactions are you requesting from the user and how is that likely to affect the user's experience. Yeah. Uh, so earlier on, uh, you showed a screenshot of Pac Man. Yeah. And in that's a case where many of these things probably just say, if you're lucky, it says it's Pac-Man or something like that. Yes, uh, exactly. And it doesn't say like it's Pac-Man and Pinky is about to get you from the left or something like right. that. Uh, and I can understand, given your research uh, interest, why you would want to focus on the ones where you can transfer na from naturalistic domains. Definitely. But I think there's lots of things where we interact with things that are not like with a, like 
you know, could call in and navigate a phone tree, like completely <laughs> abstract interactions. But we do these all the time, and yes. it is part of our common sense reasoning. It's just not like naturalistic. Yes. Uh, how, how are we gonna? What are we gonna do with it? <laughs> <laughs> how, how, how do we solve general AI? Yeah, um, that's a good question. No. So, uh, for example, like with the phone tree situation, um, I think you're to a point where direct language-based reasoning is no longer sufficient. Now you need to have a sense of the internal state of the system. So instead of, you know, either your screenshot, your screenshot needs to represent the entire state inherently, or you as an agent, your algorithm needs to somehow model, like, you know, what's my goal, what's my intent, and how do I get there? So I, I'm, I hope I understood your question correctly. And I, That's I, I, Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so this was really, really fascinating. Um, and so I guess one thing I was wondering is, because we were focusing on Skyrim here specifically, and you were talking about the interaction modes you found in there. Right. I guess I'd be curious then, so is this something you'd have to hand handle then for each of the games or some thematic thing? So in, in my view, in my ambitious view of the world, if everything works perfectly, which it never does, in my view, um, all you would have to do when you transfer to a different game is give it a different list of sentences that would describe the interaction modes that you are interested in. So 10 sentences describing situations that would define your particular interaction modes that you want to explore. Okay. It never is that simple. But theoretically, that is all it would be. Right. And those things would still be provided, though, by the humans. They'd be like, this is what we call a puzzle. This is what we call a yes, larger and exactly. other interaction modes. Okay. Right. And then the system should from that point should be able to take you from pixels into text and then into interaction modes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, have you tried or do you plan on trying to establish a baseline with respect to learning directly from the pixels and, and, and removing the... So I think that would be super good to do and very smart. And the next logical step in this research, our lab just got hit with a big funding opportunity and uh, some responsibilities that we need to follow. And we are probably not going to continue this line of research anytime soon. So, yeah. How important is the, um, the form of a catch? I mean, you gave a few examples where, like, you know, the addition of this guy's buff or whatever, like, right. is, is negatively impactful. Um, but I'm thinking about, like, uh, most games have the notion of, like, a logging system for events. Oh, yeah. Would that be sufficient for this kind of thing? I'd have to look at the specific sure, syntax yeah, of the can. logging system. Uh, possibly. Okay. Possibly. So yeah. I know you just said that you uh, are not going to be able to look at this for a little while, but yeah. uh, there are some interesting corpora that you might find valuable. Oh, yeah. like, um, let's play videos online will often have like narrated accounts of what's happening mm -hmm. along with gameplay. Mm -hmm. um, and also uh, game walkthroughs on sites like gamefaqs.com uh, will just yeah. be text, but it's a lot of text about stuff that happens. Yeah, uh, that could be very games. interesting. Thank you. In the future. In the future, down the road. Um, is it, did, did you, I guess you're looking for sentences because you want to match with the human provided sentences. Um, mm -hmm. But like a yeah. lot of, in general because of the pre-trained natural language embeddings, which let us do common sense reasoning. You know, it, it lets you leverage a huge corpus. Uh, you know, you have all of Wikipedia in order to learn your basic common sense relationships, and then you get to leverage all that information. And we do believe that the sentence structure often imply, gives us a little more information that can be leveraged. But one thing that I think would really be interesting would be to combine it with uh, something like Adam's work, where instead of working off of text, maybe you can just get a vector embedding of the situation and use that and do your math in, in moment space. And that could also be very interesting. Let's thank our uh, speaker again. So it's uh, lunchtime now. Um, we don't have any kind of formally planned lunch thing. Uh, does anybody is anybody here from around here? <laughs> <laughs> we have no we have no local activities chair, as you can see, uh, in this workshop uh, organizing committee. So um, I think you know it'd be great if people want to have lunch together. A quick look at Yelp showed that um, we're in a little bit of a wasteland as far as like probably <laughs> restaurants go, but 
Uh, I think we can walk back after lunch. Yeah, hotel radius to 